forth. So what did my business do? It went like this, because if you're not lead generating on a regular basis, what happens? You get leads, you work them, you have no leads, you gotta work them, you get business, yeah, so your income will be like this. Pretty stressful. So the quicker you can learn and develop lead generation techniques, the better off you're gonna be. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the managing broker here. I um, have been in business 31 years, and this happens to be a, my second career. I was a national sales manager for a, a large corporation. Um, uh, came to California, didn't know what I was going to do, and decided to get into real estate. So I've been doing it uh, ever since. I've uh, been the broker. I've been here with Keller Williams for since 2008. I can't believe it's uh, almost uh, 10 years. And I've been the broker here for about five years, the managing broker. So I came over, when I came over originally, we relaunched this place. I was gonna be the broker of record. I had a business partner at the time, we had some falling out, so I didn't get an opportunity to invest in the company. Um, and Richard Joy became the, uh, the broker of record, or what we call here a designated officer, because we have a corporate license. Um, and then as, they realized that I wasn't involved with what was going on. They asked me to be the managing broker. So um, I've been doing that, learned a lot from it. I, like I say, I've been doing it 31 years. I learned a lot in the business. I've done hundreds of transactions. But I got to tell you, the problems that you guys get into have really uh, uh, made me much more knowledgeable than I would have been otherwise because I'm handling so many more transactions that I would have never, that I wouldn't have handled in my own career. And so, you know. They're diverse, uh, so I've, I've learned an awful lot. So back to the lead generation, we're going to talk a little bit about that because you guys have some, you had some homework, didn't you? Uh, every day you have homework, right? Yes. And that is what? What are the four things that you're supposed to do? Ten connections or ten new contacts, ten connections, ten notes, ten notes and preview ten homes per week, right? Yes. Okay. So let's just go around. I know, I, I know uh, Ada said yesterday, and I gave her a little insight to some things that she could do. Um, so I don't want to go to every person, but let me just ask you, how many of you did your 10 contacts yesterday? Good. Anybody else? So let me ask you why. Uh, the people that I connected with, I, I didn't get up to 10. Okay, so I, I wanted to talk to you. I was here, and we're going to have to have a conversation about that. I just didn't have time to do it yesterday. It is you know, here with Chris the other day. He, in my opinion, gave you a different. Um, you know, you started too. Yeah. Okay. Gave you a, uh, a different definition of what a contact, a, a connection was. Um, a contact to me, and we're gonna, we'll refine this and make sure we're all saying the same thing, but a con if you read the book, a contact, a contact is just somebody you make contact with. A connection is somebody that said, yeah, you can stay in touch with me. You know, if, pardon me? In that case, I have plenty yeah, of contacts. I'm yeah, I'm yeah. 50 then. Well, yeah, yeah, right, and so, yeah, I mean, you're gonna, you know how many calls you're gonna make before you get a connection? Lots, I mean, you're gonna, Make a lot of calls, so you. It would be. I, I. What would you? What is a connection? If you use his definition, I, you know, I didn't want to, to. You know, be not be in harmony with him, so I didn't say anything yesterday. But I, we need to come from the have the same message when we're when we're uh, discussing it. So, what are other people? What do other instructors say? What did didn't they? I mean, you know, it, it is your, now, Chris was saying yesterday that you, your connections were your Mets. Um, and you're, if you, you know, if you, if you read the book, it talks about you're going to be making contacts, and those contacts are people you don't know and people you know. And so your Mets are people that you already know. So in my opinion is you, you can have a conversation with somebody that is a, um, that is a friend, but they don't really have any need for real estate. They may say, no, I'm never planning to buy real estate. Don't bother me with it again. That wouldn't be a connection. So you just want to make sure that um, you're making your, your 10 contacts. And that is just calling people that, now listen, don't, you can't just stay on doing um, 
doing your friends and family, you've got to you know, branch out a little bit. Try doing some cold calls. There's, you're going to start seeing some expires. You know, the market seems to have tempered a little bit. We'll see what happens come down the road. But you're going to start seeing some expires. Pick up the phone and call an expired. You know, pick up the phone and call a for sale by owner. You don't see many of them here. Or go knock on doors. You know, but pick a little area that you, you know, want to work in and start knocking on doors. You're not going to get any better if you don't do it. So you got to go and do what it takes to make it in this business. Okay, so we, we so now let me ask you this again. So how many of you made your 10 contacts yesterday? How about Monday? So for those of you who didn't, why not? I know you won't give me a bunch of excuses. I'm not going to buy it. But, but you know what I said yesterday. When you don't make your call, who, who's, what stopped you? You. You know, you can, you, you're, you, you heard uh, Sam talk about the drunk monkey yesterday. And that drunk monkey is on your shoulder all the time telling you what people are going to say or do or whatever. So you've got to put that behind you. And, and yeah, and some of these people are going to say, so I, let me, I, and I wanted to tell the story yesterday, but I, wanna, I didn't want to uh, take too much of Sam's time. Uh, when, I first started, when I first got in this business, I knocked on a door. Uh, when I was, I'm walking up to the front door, there was a big sign up there that said, Happy Landing. So, you know, I'm, I'm due. I'm going to go up and knock on this door. I'm enthusiastic. So I go up and knock on the door, and the guy comes out and says, Get the hell off my porch. I gotta tell you, for months, every time I walked up on somebody's porch, that's what I thought about. And that's the drunk monkey, you know, that's the drunk monkey talking to you. And you can't let those people, there are gonna be people that are gonna yell at you. There are gonna be people that say no. You're gonna you better get accustomed to hearing the word no. Because there are people that are gonna say no to you, but it's not about the year. It's just they don't need your service. They don't need it today. So don't get you know upset. Make your contacts. You're going to get better. What you're going to find, you're going to stumble some. You're going to do a lot, especially being new. Uh, and you know what? What some of us have done. You know, you get you 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 lead generate for a while, and maybe you get off track because you're doing your transaction. You, the next time you get on the phone, it's it's getting started is as difficult as it was the very first time that you did it. Once you get rolling, you'll get going. So, um, how many connections did you make? You made any connections? Yeah. How many? I've, I've made. I've made one or two. Okay. Yeah. One in the order. Two. How many? Because uh, one of the things you're going to start doing is you need to track it. Knowing your numbers is going to help you be successful in this business. So it shouldn't be one or two, Jonathan. It should be it's, I made two. I made two connections. Well, the second one I have to do a follow-up call to see if I can start. Uh, it was a friend, and he gave me a contact uh -huh. to reach out to. Uh, it could be it, too. Okay. I just need to reach out to that person. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. so no, pardon me? I got four. Okay. I actually sent my app. So my app was not working before, and I uh -huh. just fixed it yesterday. Is it dropped on? It's not ready to send it. Yeah, okay. Good. And you couldn't send it. That, those are people you can send notes to, too. And and you can, you know, if you don't make if you don't make enough connections, you heard what Sam said yesterday. How, so, Jonathan, how many hours were you on the phone yesterday? An hour and a half. Okay. And so, how about you? How many uh, hours were you on the phone? Yeah. So, starting out, you're probably going to have to put more time on, on the phone. It's just kind of the way it is. And I was actually speaking to Brad earlier this morning, and, you know, then it starts to roll in. You know, you get momentum. Um, you get... Uh, you get excited about um, and enthusiastic about making a presentation, and uh, so. So um, you know you, you you gain confidence, and that and you know, that's just part of being on the roll. And the more times you do it, I was talking to Ada earlier, and you know she was. You want to just. You know, if somebody says, I'm thinking about selling, now, you, don't want, you don't want to do this five years in the business, but go out and make a presentation to them. You know, it isn't going to hurt you. You're just going to practice. And listen, I would rather make a mistake on somebody I, that, that, you know, there's a small chance of them listing their property than on somebody that, you know, there's a big chance that they're going to list their property. So go out and make your mistakes with those people that are your friends that are going to be easy on you. 
that, you know, are, are going to turn you down nicely. Um, and most people will be like that. You know, you'll find that most people are pretty nice. You know, if you just, if you're, if you're like knocking doors or calling and you're providing some information, most people uh, are, are usually pretty good about that. Okay, um, so notes. How many of you did 10 notes? Yeah, John. Can, so going forward, can we just get a concrete definition? Of what so Tanya, uh, let, let's, let me, just, Tanya's here in the room. Let me just ask her. So okay. yesterday, Chris said, and I was going to have a conversation with you, but, you know, contacts have come up. So I have a different definition. Chris said that contacts would be uh, somebody that said you could then communicate with them. My opinion of a contact is I called you on the phone. I made contact with you, whether you wanted to do business or not, that's a contact for me. Am I correct or am I wrong? Yeah, pretty much you're having a conversation with anybody who, about real estate. That, that's a contact. Now the connection would be you're, somebody. You're asking about and talking about real estate. Yeah. So a connection then would be somebody that says, yeah, you can call me later. You can put me on your mailing list yeah. or something like now, that. Now, so. a connection would be somebody you put in your database and right. you drip and... Right. Yeah. That's, so that's how I interpreted it. So <laughs> Now, Chris said differently yesterday, but so I wanted to get on... I, we'll have a conversation about this in our, in our meeting, but I want us to all be coming from the same place uh, and on the same page. So a connection is... In, so if you're in the grocery store, you know, I got to tell you, put your name badge on, go into the grocery store, and just start talking to people. And, and one of the things that a good question to ask is, is how long or, or what kind of work do you do? And then they're going to ask you what you do. And if you, once you say you're in real estate, they're going to be talking to you. You know, they're going to say, um, well, what's the market like? And you can say, you know, unbelievable, whatever you need to, whatever you want to say, but you can start that conversation about real estate. And then, you know, if you ask them, um, you know, do you know, are you or anybody that you know of thinking about buying, selling, or investing in real estate? You've asked the question, that's a contact. You can count that. So you can get them all over the place. You know, uh, I, a guy that trained me early on, he said, go sit in Starbucks, set up your computer, and start pulling up properties. Wear your name badge, and people will start to talk to you about real estate. You know, just kind of look around and... <laughs> He used to go like this. He said, <laughs> you know, he'd walk around like this, but, but you don't have to necessarily do that. But, you know, people want to know about real estate. So if you just let them know, I, one of the things I've noticed about realtors is they'll say, people will say, what are you doing? They go, I'm a realtor. You be proud of it. You know, be proud of what you do. Um, you know, not many people can do this business and do it well. So be good at it and you'll be, uh, You'll be a unique group. Okay. Um, well, I guess we're, I'm, I think what I'm going to do is play the video uh, first because it really shows it during his time frame. So I'm going to play one of the videos and then we're going to get you on the phone to call for 20 minutes. How's that sound? Okay. So, Tanya, you know I changed my password yesterday? Oh, good for you. Well, you were there, weren't you? And I couldn't get in today. <laughs> so it so quick. You're so good. I gotta go change it again. You're really good. Okay, this is just a quick short video. Hi, my name is Gene Rivers, and I'm here today to tell you how to develop your listing skills to a very high level, and after you've done that, you'll be able to go in and take over market share. Number one, the best source for listing leads is from your sphere and past client list. The fact is, the people you know, know the people that are gonna be moving, whether it's at church, school, work, friends, relatives. Focus on making sure they understand you're in the listing business, create a pre-listing package that you would give every seller, but rename it your guide to selling homes successfully in your market. And then give that to the people in your database that you know have influence as collateral materials that they can give to their friends and refer you. Step two, focus on an area, product, or price range. When you develop mastery of a product or an area, you will much more quickly succeed in those areas. 
and in that area or in that product or price range, focus on the FISBOs in that area, the expires in that area, door knock in that area, geographic farm in that area, and I'm talking a fairly tight area so that the people in that area will really, really identify with you as someone who can help them sell property for top dollar with low hassle in a short amount of time. Now we're at number three, everyone today that's looking at hiring an agent, whether it's a referral, even a past client, or a, a stranger who's gotten your name somehow, they're going to check you out on the web. So you need to make sure that your website is competent, that you've got basic, powerful content in there, and specifically that on the landing page, the very opening page, there is a direct offering to a seller. Find out what your home is worth, get a guide to selling your home, but if you don't do that, you're going to miss opportunities because people will get your name, check your website out, and go, oh, I don't think so. I've seen a lot better sites. Fix your website with a database that you are working on a consistent basis. And with a tight focus, you build your reputation. If you're visible, you will find you will take over more and more listings. And in a very short amount of time, 12 to 24 months, you will own that market. That's how you take market share. So any ahas? No ahas? Yeah. Well, I, it was really simple. I'm thinking about my farm. Why not make a how to sell your home a little packet? I mean, that's what a, a good piece that would be. Hand that out. Go knock. And you know, an area especially is not a bad way to start. Um, I mean, you got to, you're going to have to do other things as well. I mean, you probably want to do open houses, great source for buyers. Um, you do want to be, end up being a listing agent down the road because listings will attract buyers for you. But the best way, in my opinion, the best way to start out is to be a, uh, to be a selling agent or work or work for the buyer. Um, because it's less expensive. You get a listing, you know, what do you have to do when you get a listing? Right? You got to put marketing materials and they need to be staged. Um, so that costs you money. Generally, when you're starting up, you don't have a lot of money, but if you get a buyer and you can put gas in your car, you can sell them a property. And, you know, if you're a, um, a relatively new agent, you're probably going to overprice the property. Uh, if you're listing a property, you're probably going to overprice it because you don't have the confidence to get the price in line. Um, and so you set on it, it costs you more money, and then maybe it expires and you don't make anything. But if you have a buyer that is real, then you can, you can have them in escrow within 30 days and be closed in 60 days. Not a bad way to go if you need some cash in your pocket. Okay, any other, any questions? No? Okay, so you have your list with you? Everybody have their calling list? Uh oh, we're, we're losing them. As soon as we talk about calling. <laughs> Janice, where are you going? <laughs> you all have your list? Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> You're having a call? Yeah. I just came from the listing appointment. Did you? No, I just listed house the house in Tory Highlands for 925 at 6%. Plus $395 commission. Additional commission. Right. And uh, guess how I got that? Oh, oh, yeah. Hi. I was just wondering who do you know in your neighborhood that might be thinking about it? I called him four months ago. I think they're selling a lead. It's going to be $27,000. They said they but don't get on the phones. Don't get on the phone. And they said maybe I'm thinking about selling in, in four months, and you yep. put them. And I just so that would be a connection, them. right? So the first one would have been a contact. We had one contact plus one connection. And um, and look, he followed up, did whatever he did. You can put him into a campaign, um, and then. They can become a client. Oh, could you repeat that? Did you send them a personal note? Card? I sure did. Oh, really? That's so old school. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't work, so uh, not do it. Uh, How did you get their number? Information. Cold calling just a phone number list from Cole Realty. 
So one of the things that you can do that I used to do when I would cold call is you can just take an exchange that you know is in an area that you might want to work and start dialing numbers to attach four numbers to it. So, you know, in, in, in PQ, it was uh, 484. So you can do 484-0001, or you can do 000. I don't know if you can anybody on that. 0002. You can get a lot of numbers that are disconnected. Now, the truth is today, so many people have cell phones that you don't get a lot of landlines anymore, but it's just that, you know, people use the, um, use the Haynes directory. It's just for, for people's home phone numbers as well. So it's just another way that you get a lot of faxes and you're going to get a lot, but you're going to get a lot of that anyhow. You know, there is no perfect list of uh, calling lists for you. So any way you can get a number, uh, you know, it, it used to work for me. I'd get people and they'd go, how'd you get my number? I go, I'm just call a sequential list of numbers. They go, oh, okay. So, uh, there's a lot you of heard that guy get. Snowden from the NSA? Yeah, yeah I heard he's got your number. <laughs> yeah, now uh, after Equifax, everybody has your number. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so let's get you on the phone and start calling. Get your list out. <laughs> Phones, you ever have a phone with them? That's going to be your list to call off of. Let me know if you get uh, if you get any appointments. You got it. <laughs> or even a connection. We'll talk about it when you get finished. Don't get too far. I want you to stay here in the room. It's a little noisy, but. Contact where you talk to somebody. And you have to ask them for business. 
We'll be on your strategy. You've got to say, do you know anybody hey, thinking yeah, about buying? I don't know anybody else who's calling to. I always say it back first. I'm now with that. I say, well, how about you? You were talking about buying. Do you get it? Maybe looking for call and don't answer. Isn't that still a contact? I don't remember exactly. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know if you can get me his contact. Now, if you decide you want to leave a message and they call you back, I don't know I always leave messages. A lot of people don't know. Let's see if it's none of it's uh you know a friend or something like that. Just go call you and not um, but if it's a friend or something, you know, hey, it's still a thing about it. I don't know that I've gotten the real estate. Yeah. Whatever your feel is, you know, you can, I mean, there's tons of scripts. You've got tons of scripts in here that you can use for, you know, Matt's um, and your sphere. Oh, we're not. Hey, make some calls. Right.
So I have um, someone who's like in a couple months they're looking to sell a home. Um, so at what point when I talk, because I also want to help them by buying as well, just obviously. Um, so at what point in that process, like, do you discuss them looking to buy a place, like, just right, right away? Well, or would they sure. think that's I, like. Here's why, because, you know, you, you know, familiar with what their house sells, yeah, they're, they're going to be reluctant yeah. to accept some yeah. offers because yeah. they don't have yeah. to go. So okay. they know so that there's places out there for them. And those okay, so would it be like something where they think like, oh, you're refining it? Well, yeah, I would take it. I don't know. Well, they ask. Yeah. Like, you know, buyers so close to the house. I would take it. 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 Yeah. So, um, closer to our where we work in the first town. Okay, so you guys are interested in this, and you're talking about the future of property in mind. Uh, to purchase when when we sold your house. <laughs> 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 oh, we're scared to listen because uh, no point. That's all right. When you guys do this, I'm going to say, yeah, you trust us. So, so if you felt like, you might want to even move forward. Or is two months in time to be I'm sorry. And okay, well, how about this? You don't know anybody. You don't know anybody. So, how about so, you get down to your contact information? I can let you know when I see you. So, what happens the first day you take the money? You're going to decide that you have to have someone that you can get before. So, they don't know whether it's worth the money. So, you can get them accustomed to it. And maybe even watch them. They can see what's sold, what's not 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 sold, what this list is, okay. you can tell them. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you want to You don't want to give me your email? Yeah. Okay, well, so, thank you so much. I have a question for Suzanne. Is that correct? Okay. Well, yeah. All right, Suzanne. So, I'll keep in touch. Uh, I'll let you know when things get exciting, all right? How about you're, if I ask you have a good day? How about we get the couch and we'll see you in the morning? Take care, bye. Find the areas that you're looking at. No, so check on the search and that way you'll see what's interesting. And they're going to be sure your way. So if you see one that you really love, you know, we may be able to get your home on the market. Yeah, that's that's on. Yeah. 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 Would that be okay? You want to get them engaged in the process as quickly as you can. Thank you. 
Tuesday. I got messed up yesterday. I got Joe over here. I got messed up with the video for the doors. If you know anyone who's just called on let me know. Yes, you want to sell my Yeah, I do.
So that's more of a business. That's a business opportunity, not commercial. And that's even stranger. You know, you have to list all this, all the inventory. So, yeah, I, I, I had a friend who used to work in <laughs> yeah. a business all of a sudden. Because, because yeah. you, you can miss every day. What would it take for you? Yeah. Yeah. That person who goes, hey, you can call me. Yeah. So all of a sudden, every single red is like a yellow. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Instead of calling all these calls, no, I would just prefer it out. Have you ever talked to it? Do you have that many so, people that you can call that you have talked to? I like that. So that was my only concern. But okay. Any, uh, any leads? Yep. You got a lead? Well, I, I talked to. Someone who has a brother is actually actively working. Uh huh. And, uh, and are they working with somebody? Uh, no, it doesn't sound like it. So. Uh, we might want to ask that question. Gonna, well, I got his number. So no, no. Well, and it's sometimes better because they may go, "Yeah, I'm working with somebody," but oh, I hate him, you know, and you say, "Well, great." Yeah. Um, I got a hold of so, a couple of other people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had one lady who wasn't interested, and by the end, she said, "You can keep calling me if you want." Okay. So that's a connection. Yep. So you got one contact and one connection, right? So, you know, get some email addresses, set them up on a campaign. Um, and I heard somebody, I don't know, I don't remember who it was, but you know, you might want to say, you mind, oh, I think it might've been you, Richard. I wouldn't say, I'm going to put you in my database. I would say, do you mind if I send you some marketing material or some information on real estate? I mean, database seems kind of cold. I'm gonna put you in my database, and then I'll never talk to you again. You know, so, um, so I, I would you maybe use a little different language on that. Um, I don't know if it was you or not. I just think it was. Um, so good. You know, the more you do it, the easier it'll get. I know in this room when there's a lot of people around, and and one of the things I noticed is none of you had a list when you came. You remember you're supposed to be prepared when you show up here. So what I'd like for you to do is tonight. I know you're going to get out of your four o'clock and you got other things going on, but go set and write down, you know, 10 or 15 people you can call to, and that you'll, be, you'll be here on Friday, right? Again, um, that you can call on Friday um, or whatever your next date is that you call. Like, does Tanya do a, is there a coaching on Friday or no? It's all classes on trying to be on Friday as well. So just be prepared. That's all I'm asking. Is that you you look through your homework, you know, it's at the it's the back of here, it'll tell you what your homework is. And it's always gonna be how many contacts per day? How many connections per day? How many note cards? So what you probably want to do if you connect with somebody and um, send them a note card after the fact. I mean, what a way to cement the relationship is to, you know, and, and Tanya was talking about, you know, people are like, and especially younger people, your texters and all that stuff, but think about yourself. When you get a handwritten note in the, in the mail, you know those people spent a little bit of time doing that, didn't they? And so it kind of endears them to you, and that's kind of what you want to do. You want to endear people to you. This is a relationship business. And so your goal is to build relationship. When I was first got in this business, somebody said to me, uh, it was a trainer, and he said, you know, if you make relationships more important than doing the real estate, people will stand in line to work with you. So when you, you know what they used to say at Century 21, other, everybody claims that I, I think that, that, uh, um, that Brian Buffini's claiming it. I saw somebody put it out said Brian Buffini claimed it, but if, when I started with, with Century 21, they used to say, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So it's just another way of saying this is a, rela a relationship business. Okay, so I'm gonna do one more um, video for you and then we're gonna get uh, Brad up here. And... short and sweet. So you've got a pretty uh,
Let's go here. Are you able to scroll down? Mm -hmm. Are you able to scroll down on the screen? Oh, thanks, Ben. <laughs> Do you want to come up and do this, John? I mean, it says you're better at it than so, I am. I mean, I can give it a try, but I guarantee you. It's actually supposed to be playing. Now, there's something wrong with the video. Yeah, it's like it's like like I just played it yesterday, so it shouldn't be. There we go. Refresh the page. Somewhere else back here. F five. Talking just refresh. Here we go. There's no bar up there. Just hit F five. Press, yeah, press the big black line. Let's see if I can see. Oh, yeah, one. Yeah, it's probably a problem with the internet. Yeah, there's something going on. Okay. Yeah, it's going on. Well, we'll just we'll give Brad an extra five minutes. So here's our uh, our featured speaker, feature agent today. His name is Brad Seaman. He's been in the business since he was two <laughs> seriously his dad owned a company so brad's been around a long time very knowledgeable one of my favorite agents here he doesn't get in trouble your favorite <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sorry he is my Except favorite that one agent. little guy that i got in trouble on that's it like this brad yeah. good. okay so welcome brad <laughs> all right let me stand up for a second you guys have been sitting you've been talking stand up for a second so here's the reason why I asked you to stand up. Okay, uh, first impressions are everything. We're going to talk about pre-listing. We're going to talk about listing. Get stretched out. I know you need a little bit of a break. I won't be offended if you need to step out of the room to use the restroom or anything. Uh, you might miss something. I don't go backwards. So thank you very much. You can sit down. Um, Gary, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Brad Seaman. Uh, I operate a small team here called the Seaman Team. Um, I've been doing it for nine years selling and managed a recruiting team before that for real estate agents. Um, uh, I have, I was born into the business, whether I like it or not. Um, I, I resisted every single moment along the way to start selling real estate, and look where I am. So I'm selling real estate. Um, my family owned a large real estate office, uh, large real estate company here in San Diego, five offices, and uh, they sold it to Cole Banker in 2007. I was a part of that transition, and once I was done with the transition, they had offered me a position. I declined and actually went into residential sales in 2008. Guess what time in the market that was? Yeah. Interesting, right? Um, you know, and it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me um, was starting at the worst time. I mean, I had to learn the hardest way possible, right? Everyone in this room probably knows somebody who's thinking about buying or selling. In 2008, there was zero people that I knew that wanted to buy or sell real estate. So I had to go figure it out, right? Um, and, and luckily, I had my arms wrapped around the business enough to get out there and actually figure it out, right? So my first year wasn't anything special. I got into the business. I paid my way. Um, spent a lot of money advertising, doing whatever I could to get into the short sale piece. And then after that, I started uh, flipping houses. I flipped to date uh, just over 100 homes. Um, I was buying at the courthouse steps. I had eight agents underneath me doing uh, broker price opinions on a regular basis. I was driving all over the county, driving myself crazy. And in 2011, both my investors, I had two clients at the time, both my investors said, that's it, we're getting out. And I was back to 2008 again. Um, hard lesson learned, right? Uh, always have more than two clients. Um, so <laughs> when, when that changed and we, my investors exited the market, I had to reinvent again. So I'm like, okay, back into residential resale again. Let's figure out how this is going to work. Um, and so at that time, I actually utilized a lot of the skills that I had from flipping houses and implemented them into what I do today on the listing side. 
Um, so a uh, majority of my business is listing. Um, I have our team right now consists of myself, my wife, who is still a part of my team, but uh, the team at home. So she runs uh, the household and our three little ones um, and comes in to help uh, on a occasion. She's actually in today. Um, Donna, who is my full-time assistant, and uh, Debbie, who is my full-time showing agent and handles all the buyers. Okay, so that's uh, how we're made up. Um, right now, my number one goal is to make appointments, go on appointments, close contracts. That's it. Okay, so I've gotten to the point where my focus is the listing. My focus is I want to take as many listings as possible in a shorter as little time as possible, get them out there, and it creates more business every single time I, I take a listing. So the more listings I do, the more buyers I get, the more money we make, okay? Um, so today is gonna be a little bit unconventional. I'm gonna teach you about uh, my listing presentation, okay? I'm gonna give you my listing presentation. You can have it. You can't copy it. You're gonna need to look at it today but you actually have access to my listing presentation right through Keller Williams. So my goal today is to teach you that the listing presentation, the pre-listing package is not really that special or important. It's the confidence that you put behind it that is truly important when you actually go on the appointments, okay? Um, so we'll, we'll go through kind of uh, the process from the, the phone call that I get to what happens before the appointment actually takes place, what parameters I put in place before I actually sit in on the appointment, what information they get ahead of time, and what happens in the appointment itself. Who in here so far has gone on a listing appointment? Okay. Successfully? You guess? Sign? Yes. Okay, that's success. And I know Dan, I know you. So here's the interesting part. What I think is most important in real estate agents today is to understand making contacts, converting to appointments, and getting in front of people. Don't go out and spend a whole bunch of time in what I'm gonna teach you and what's in my listing, pre-listing package or what happens in my listing appointment. Go find the clients first. 90% of this room hasn't even had the opportunity to, to, to utilize what I'm gonna tell you today, right? So this is all great. This is fantastic, but until you have a listing in front of you, a seller sitting in front of you, none of this applies, right? And so don't go out and spend 25 hours building your pre-listing package tomorrow. Don't do it. If you need to, go use the one that Keller Williams provides. And that's it, okay? The focus needs to be, you need to find as many clients as you can, as fast as you can, especially as you're just getting started in this business. Okay, if anyone would have, I wish they would have told me when I first started, that would be it. Because I went out and I had to know everything and I had to understand everything and I had to build my listing presentation and I had to spend $39.99 on every single thing that came across my desk until I went, oh my gosh, I don't have enough clients to do anything with this. And I had these big like ups and downs in the first couple of years I was in the business. If you just go out and train yourself, get teaching from the office here on how to find clients every single day, this will all fall, in, all, all fall into place, okay? So, a um, couple of things. Um, who here has gotten a referral for a listing? So someone that's called you and said, hey, I know someone who's thinking about selling, okay? How does that phone call go when you receive first off the referral? How does that phone call go? Did you, did you call, Justin, did you outbound call this person and they told you, hey, I know somebody who's thinking about selling? No, actually, it was uh, an ad through Facebook that I put out. One of my close friends just reached out and said his mom wants to sell. His mom wants to sell? Yeah. Okay. And so what happened next? Well, right now, she's actually in Seattle for the next month and a half, okay. um, which is where, coincidentally, she's going to move to after she sells. Mm -hmm. So I asked for her number, and he wants me to wait until she's back. Okay. Yeah. So, and do you know why he wants you to wait? I didn't want to pry. He seemed uncomfortable giving me his mom's number, even though I've been friends with him for well, some years. Oh, he hasn't given it to you? Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, and that all happened, transpired through Facebook? Uh, yes, actually. Um, I ended up going, I took over a present to him the other day because he, you know, referred me. It hasn't happened yet, but I thought, mm -hmm. you know what? 
Reward, reward the action, not the result. Uh -huh. right? So I brought over a little present to him, um, and then spent some time with him just a couple days ago, but still wants me to wait. So. Okay. Yeah. Any other examples? Uh, door knocking. Uh, there was a lady who I had met one time. Her dog was on the street. I brought her dog home. And this was before I had my license. She was the first door I knocked on. She was very excited to see me. She told me like five neighbors that were thinking about selling. So, awesome. so yeah, a lot of, a lot of hits, but I've been able to contact all but one. One of them, their cars always hope their dogs bark, but they won't answer the door. Mm -hmm. But, um, the other ones I've been able to talk to and they had agents already. So they agents. were already, they were already on the, they were already, one of them was waiting two, three years and the others were, um, had agents. Potential leads, which is great. Yeah. Did you ask her permission to use her name or did you ask for their phone numbers? Uh, yeah, she said she said I could use her name. I didn't ask for phone numbers. I just went and knocked on the door. She told me which house is. Perfect. So what I'm going to queue up for you is you know a traditional call that I get. Okay, and I was looking for an example to kind of use as an example that was successful in transition. Um, you know, my typical call is somebody that I know in my sphere of influence, somebody that I've reached out to, that I've followed up with, that calls me and says, "Hey, Brad, my neighbor down the street is thinking about selling their house. They were just over to my place last night." And they said, you know, they haven't decided to work with a realtor yet, but they're really thinking about it. Um, can I give them your information? Okay. And what do you think I said? No. No. So my first thing was, oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for thinking about me. Reward the action, not the result. And would it be okay if I reached out to them? And they'll go, oh, well, yeah, they're really close friends. I didn't really talk about that, but absolutely. Here's their phone number. Okay, great. Would it be okay if I used your name when I called them? Yeah, sure. No problem. We just talked about you last night. That's great. Okay, fantastic. I'll let you know how it goes. I'll make sure I update you. And I'm going to give them a call right away. Okay? So that's what typically happens in a lot of, and this takes time. It will happen to you too. Uh, but this takes time before this, this starts to take place. Now, the phone call, I pick up the phone and I call into the referral, okay? They may or may not know that I'm gonna call, right? I pick up the phone, I say, ring, ring. Hi, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, how are you doing today? Oh, great, oh, you know what? Joni said that, Joni's not even the name, is it? <laughs> Janie said that uh, you might be interested in selling your home and she said that it would be okay that I reached out to you. Is now a good time? Oh yeah, great time. So you're thinking about selling your home. Why, why are you selling? He said, well, we haven't really decided to sell or not yet, but we're thinking about moving to Oregon. Okay. Now this has opened the path for me, right? So I'm, it's a wide open referral. And now I have this opportunity to figure out what's going to take place next. The moment that they've agreed to talk to me about the sale of their home means I'm, gonna get, I'm getting an appointment before I get off the phone. Okay, no matter what, I will not hang up the phone until I get the appointment because they've opened the door. They've told me that I'm going to sell. Okay, great. Now, I, Gary mentioned something a little bit earlier that said maybe going on a couple of appointments, even though they're not ready to sell tomorrow. Um, I am a proponent of I go on every appointment. I might be a little bit different than a lot of agents, but I'm going to qualify them. And if I feel that they are qualified enough for me to go on the appointment, and that's 90% of them. I have pretty loose standards when it comes to how qualified they need to be. I'm gonna go sit in front of them because the, the opportunity is twofold. One is if they tell me, oh yeah, I wanna be in Oregon in six months, what does that mean? They have to start now. Yeah. One, they have to start now. What else? They need to buy in Oregon. They might need to buy in Oregon. What else? They probably mean three. So I'm gonna teach you something with buyers and sellers. Normally when they say six, cut it in half. They say 12, cut it in half. Buyer wants to buy something in the next 12 months, cut it in half, okay? So if you schedule yourself to call somebody and follow up with them, they told you they were gonna sell in six months, you better be calling them way in advance with the expectation that they're gonna sell in three. And if you miss that window, they're gonna be gone because somebody else is following up with them. Okay. Dan and I were just outside talking about a client that we went on an appointment together on 
And I mean, just a train wreck now. They have lots of problems going on with this property and they're gonna take some time and it's probably gonna take them six months. And Dan and I, what was our conversation? When do we follow up? When am I gonna call them? Soon. Two weeks, right? Just because they told me it's gonna take them a long time before they're ready, it means I'm gonna follow up as much as I can. I'm just gonna reach out of an olive branch and say, hey, what can I do to help you? How can I support you? What can we do to get you onto the next step? Um, and, and do whatever I can. So if they say they're gonna sell at three, or they say they're gonna sell at six, and you think they're probably gonna sell at three, you, you don't waste three months and you call them in like a month or two? Or I, I'll normally cut it in half or, or less. Okay. If it's six months out, I'm gonna call them in a month. Okay. And then I'm gonna call them again in another month. Okay. okay? So if it's six months, you think they'll probably sell in three and you're gonna call them halfway between now? Yes, it's something like that. That's a pretty good metric. Uh-huh. You know, I don't know. But when you call them, you're not saying, are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? What, what do you say when you... It's all supportive. You want it just like, just like Gary said, it all comes down to how can you care about them? You're building a relationship. You're not selling them on anything. You're building a relationship with them. So I... In the pre-qualification process, I need to figure out whatever nugget I can get from them of what's important to them so that the next time that I call them, I know what to talk about. And it might just be, like in, in Dan and my example, it might just be, hey, I know you're having some permit issues with the city. I'm not an expert in permits, but what can I do to support you? I don't know. I don't know how to help them at all, to be completely honest with you. I mean, I don't know what I could help them with at the city. I, Dan and I, Dan even offered, he'll, I'll go sit with you at the city. And take notes. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all about showing that you care about them, but not overextending your boundaries and over committing to something that you don't know about, right? But I'm always looking for that little nugget. So the first thing, and there's actually in your book, there's a, a pre-qualification script when you get them on the phone. And I wanted you to understand that when I go through this, I'm asking questions to find out motivation, I'm asking questions to find out if I should even go on the appointment. And I'm asking questions that I can find out for future follow-up. So even if I don't take the appointment tomorrow, I can follow up with them over the next month, six months, whatever it takes. It might be two years sometimes before they'll actually commit to an appointment with me and want to actually sell something. Okay? So on page, um, actually it's the second page in here. I don't know what it is in yours. 13, thank you. So there's a couple of questions in here. Okay, so how did you hear about us? What does that help us with? Reinforce that you're a referral. Referral? Maybe they're not a referral. Oh. Whether your advertising is perfect, great answer. Whether your advertising is working or not. And advertising doesn't mean print advertising in the newspaper. It might mean how many times you're calling your sphere. It might mean how well your Yelp is, uh, account is doing. It, it could mean anything. But sourcing the business and what's working and what's not is super important. What else can you do with that question? Spend your money. Where to spend your money. But how about, how do, you, how do you understand the seller? What about where they came from tells you something about them? And how can you reinforce that relationship? Okay. When I find out that somebody came to me from Yelp, I know exactly how to talk to them. I'm gonna ask them, oh, what, what was your favorite review that you read about me? And it sounds super egocentric, but you know what? I've got them, I, I figured it out. Or I'll say, you know, did you read the review about me helping you remodel your home before you sell? And I don't even care if they read it or not, but now they know that I remodel homes, mm -hmm. I can help them with yeah. fixing up the house before it's ready for sale. And there's a review on Yelp. And there's a review on Yelp, because even if they didn't read it, they can go back and read it. So anyways, that works for me, but um, if it's a referral from somebody else, what else can it do? I get calls all the time that I, I don't know where they came. I had a guy relocating from Georgia. I never met the guy in his entire life. He, want, he went into Costco, met one of my past clients, called me on the phone and said, hey, I was referred to you and we couldn't figure out where he came from. It took us a month and a half. We were almost closed in escrow before we figured out where he came from. Yeah. And it would have been really helpful for me to call the past client, send them a little gift, another reason why I should know where it comes from. What were you saying? Well, I was just gonna say, you can talk about the person that you haven't got. That's right, yeah. 
make that connection <laughs> and follow up with that person that referred them, right? Absolutely. That's a, that's a huge one to reinforce it, update them, let them know what's going on. What kind of gifts do you get? Oh boy. Um, I'm sure it depends on what the size <laughs> of the deal, how close you are. To that it actually doesn't stuff. matter at all. Okay. So that's not the hard part. The hard part is when do I give them and how do I do it? Always re reward when you're getting a referral, always re reward the action, not the closing. Okay? If you re reward the closing, they'll forget about you. And you're celebrating your paycheck, not the ability to receive a referral from your friend, family member, et cetera. Okay? It doesn't have to be big. All it has to be is personal. Okay? Um, for years and years and years, I just did a $10 Starbucks card and a handwritten note. Okay? I started doing different things and playing with it like, now I send a book packaged FedEx in the mail. That's a thank you book with a little note for me inside it, hoping that it goes on their coffee table. Um, because the gift of Starbucks, as they start to evolve, goes away pretty quick, right? That card doesn't follow them in the wallet. They go out and buy coffee for them and one other person, and then it's gone. Okay, so the hope was, if I give them a book, maybe they'll pick it up one day and go, oh, Brad, oh, I know somebody who's thinking about selling. So what I started doing, I found a little $8 book uh, online that it says thank you, and it says all the different ways that I can say thank you. It could be like multilingual, it could be just a bunch of quotes from different people. That's what I've been doing. It seems to work pretty well. Uh, people comment on it and send me notes back. So for the referral, that's what I send. All right, so I'm going to move on to a couple more questions, kind of uh, scoot through these. So where are you moving? Okay, if they're going to Oregon, Seattle, somewhere, you can refer them and find an agent there. You also know what's important to them. Maybe they're moving for kids. Maybe they're moving for grandkids. Maybe, maybe they're relocating for a job. You start to dig into why they're moving and what kind of person they are too. At that point, I, I start to find out, are they re relocating for a job? Do they work for SAIC or are they a salesperson, right? I'm very adaptive to who I'm sitting in front of or next to, and I want to understand their personality really well because I will mold to them. Right? If it's an engineer, that's a tough one for me typically. Engineer personalities are harder for me than most. Um, but I will work my best to adapt to what their style is in every presentation. A salesperson is really easy for me. So if somebody's in sales, it's like get to the point, let's move through this, and let's get to the contract. So I can read people pretty well. It, I'm listening to this stuff over the phone. Like I know if it's the wife talking, I know who the hus what, where the husband works. I want to know what they do and what their personality style is. Um, what's motivating to move them there? How soon do you have to be there? Time. We talked about that a little bit. Um, sometimes it's a hard time. Sometimes it's, oh, yeah, we're just thinking about retiring there. And in that case, when it's a loose time, you typically want to cut it in half. If, if it's a hard time, be realistic about the hard time, right? If I need to be there in three months, well, they need to be there in three months, and you really have to start planning on how to get it on the market. Uh, if we sell it in 30 days, will that pose a problem for you? What, why is that question interesting? They don't have a new place to live. Okay. So we talk about objections potentially if they might not be able to move that quick. That's it, one. It's like a humble break. There you go. Yeah. You got it. So it's showing, and, and this is something in my pre-listing package that I'm going to show you. It's, it's showing what you're capable of without telling them how you do it, okay? So if you can show them through questions or through what you've presented without talking about it, it will show them that you're capable of doing it. Reputation in my listing appointments is everything. I want my reputation to precede me. I want them to know a little bit about me, and I want them to know what I do before I even show up to the door. Okay. How many people think that I talk about marketing in my listing presentations? Did I just serve that up too easy for you? I don't. I, talk, I, don't, I mean, Gary and I were talking about, I don't talk about marketing at all. Unless they really bring it up and it's super important to them, they're a marketing major, they want to talk about what I do. It's pretty simple. I don't really talk about it. What do you think I talk about in a listing appointment? How many of them are quickly sold? All about them. What are they concerned about? What are their worries? What are their objections? How special is their house? 
Everybody thinks it's special for the most part. And there's different gradients of that. When I went into last night, I mean, should I stage the house? I don't think so. I mean, it literally lives like a museum. And a in style today museum, like a stager would set it up. I'm like, it's like, can I have a list of things you want me to do to the house? I'm like, nope. Just do what you're doing. <laughs> I'll put it on the market. We're good. So how do you put that balance? Because you were saying that one of the things you, you know, it's all about reputation, but then right after that you said it's all about them. So where do you balance? So it's super important. It, it, I don't talk about my reputation in the appointment. Okay. I want them to, I want my reputation to precede me. So okay. before I show up, okay. they're going to know about Yelp or they're going to know about my pre-listing package or they're going to find me some way or even a word of mouth referral. They're going to know me somehow before I show up. Even if it was a sign call, they're going to figure out that they're, they've seen me along the way or some, some connection before I show up to the actual appointment. Or they Google you right off the bat. That's what, they, that's what Gene Rivers was talking about when he said have a website. Go Google me. It's actually kind of interesting. Google yourself. What shows up? You really they're going to Google you. You really ought to Google yourself and see what shows up. And find avenues of where you can create a simple, easy presence. Review websites are probably one of the easiest to get started on, at least have something to have a placeholder business card. Now, I think that a third party site is more powerful than my own website. So somebody that holds a third party site like Yelp, which has its own challenges, that is way more pow powerful to me than my own actual website. Make sense? So that's the reputation piece, or it could even be word of mouth. So I can make a connection with somebody that we know somebody mutually and I was respected by them. Uh, what happens if your home doesn't sell? Um, how much do you want to list for? Do you ask that to people before you go on the appointment? Next one. How much, how much uh, do you want to list it for? Yeah. I, I, I changed a little bit. What do you think your home is worth? That's what I said. Yeah. Okay. Gives me an indication of what I'm walking into and what the challenges will be at the actual appointment. How much do you owe on the property? Um, I personally, in this market right now, I don't get into that over the phone. That's a question, one of the first questions I ask when I'm actually in person. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be sending you a little something via email or mail or however you decide to deliver it. Would you take a few moments to read it, and in my case, fill out a little form for me um, uh, for, to be prepared for when we meet, okay? If I send them a package and ask them to fill out a form, and I show up in my first impression when I walk, walk in and sit at the table, and it's not filled out, what does that tell you? Yeah, not serious, maybe. I'm cautious of that. What else? They might be interviewing, they may not be ready. It gives me a lot of different things that go through my mind because if they were willing to show up, fill out the information, once I can get somebody to sign or fill something out, things progress quickly, okay? If I show up and the paper's on top, my package is there and they're sitting and they're ready to go, I'm taking that listing. I'm walking out of, the, I'm walking out of that building with a listing, okay? It just tells me, how organized they are, that they're serious about it, that they're going to do it. Now, it's not to say that if they don't fill it out, that I'm not going to take the listing. It just means that I've got some objection or something to answer before I can walk away with it. Okay? Um, how do you set the expectation for how long the appointment's going to be? Trust me, you want to do this. Please start doing this. On the call. Yep. How long? 20 to 30 minutes. 20 to 30 minutes? Okay. I, I, I say 45 minutes to an hour is what I use. You don't have to use what I use. Okay. Um, if it is a straight listing appointment where I'm selling a house and I'm not doing, I'm not helping them with any renovations, it will take me 30 to 45 minutes. If it turns into more complex or there's more objections, it will probably take me closer to an hour. If there's a buy, sell, remodel, obviously it's going to take me longer. Um, those are my most fun appointments, though. Even if it takes me an hour and a half or two hours, I walk away with lots of opportunity and lots of things going on. Okay. Um, setting the expectation is the point here that I want to make, though. 
If you're setting the ex if you're not setting an expectation, you've already set them up to drive the appointment. Okay, you have the agenda when you walk in the door of how you're going to guide the appointment. You need to be in control. If you're not in control, it actually comes off as you're passive and you're not guiding them through the actual process. They will react to you, okay? So you have to show confidence, set an expectation of what's going to happen, what the next steps are, and what's going to happen in your appointment. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Questions about that? Oh, I got a question, huh? So you ask them, you say to them, this appointment's going to take about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, do you ask them, you ask permission, do they have enough time to, to do that? Do you ask them that question? No, that's, I typically go right there to close for the appointment. So I don't ask permission for the time, mm -hmm. I ask for permission for the appointment. Mm -hmm. So I say, you know, typically our appointments will take about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, do you have time at 2 o'clock on Friday by any chance? that we can get together, okay? And they look at their calendar, oh, my husband or, or, my, or my wife or whatever it is, and that brings out, okay, making sure that all of the decision makers are present as well. And I typically do that in advance, so this runs a little differently than how I ask the questions. Are the decision makers going to be there? What happens if you want a listing appointment with only one party? <laughs> there is an objection you can't overcome. Rarely can you overcome. So you're not going on the appointment, okay? You need to determine who's gonna be there. Are they the decision maker? And sometimes the decision makers are entitled. Just keep that in mind. Mom might be the decision maker. There might be an ex-spouse. There, there's all sorts of different things that can happen. So that question is actually just the way it's written is a great way to ask. Are all the decision makers present? Okay, yeah? Um, if you get a call and they say, need to move fast, can you, or maybe not even that, but can you come tomorrow? Do you do that, and if you do, does that change? So, my rule of thumb is I always set appointments 48 hours in advance, okay? Um, if I can qualify them, which just happened to me last month, not a couple weeks ago now, um, I got a, a phone call, it happened to be off Yelp, they called me, they said, look, I found you on Yelp, you sound like the great agent in the area, you know, we wanna interview a couple people, we leave town on Saturday morning, which was, it was Friday at like 5.30 when they called me. And I'm like, See, we leave Saturday morning. I'm like, you might book my day is full. So I asked them a couple more questions. I said, okay, so what's the situation? What are you looking to accomplish? And got through a longer uh, needs analysis over the phone. And I determined that it's a trust. They need help fixing it up. And I'm like, oh gosh, I got to take this appointment. Because the moment I walk in, I'm going to get it. Um, so I made sure that it was the right appointment for me, and then I quickly, literally, had my I had my assistant email the pre pre appointment package or the pre listing package. I showed up the next day at ten in the morning, and took the listing that day, um, and took it over to their friend who was actually at the mother's funeral. Funeral, which I know that's terrible, but you know, I knew I had to take the appointment. I knew I had to go, or else it, it, it would be gone. I wouldn't get another opportunity yet. So normally 48 hours, uh, it gives me enough time to prepare, pull comps. At this point, my presentation does not change. Everyone gets the same presentation, okay? I now have three versions, but they're all stock. So there's 10 of them printed in our office that at any time can be shipped out or emailed directly to the client. I used to ship them in FedEx, have them delivered at their door, have a runner show up. We just got to the point where this is too crazy. And so it's time to email it. So we just email every package. If I feel like they're really not tech savvy, then I'll have it delivered. Um, <clears throat> roughly, just to get a gauge of some brand new, how many listing presentations do you close now as a percentage compared to when you were one or two years in business? Um, I close between 90 and 95% of every appointment I go on. Um, and let me preface that with, with a couple things. So the majority of my business is network referral, past clients, sphere of influence, and then reputation-based referrals. So I'm not competing most of the time. Normally it's, what do I do? How do I do it? What do you want me to pay you? Okay, so it's, I'm fortunate enough to be at that point in my career 
that it gets easier and easier because I'm not going up against three other agents in most cases. Now there's some where I do, um, but I don't market to the masses. So I'm not sending out postcards to 92128 hoping to compete with all the big, the big guys in the office. Um, most of mine's referral, but that means I sell Spring Valley, I, spit, I sell Del Mar, I sell Carlsbad, you know, writing an offer for 1.4 million in Carlsbad. We've got a listing next door to me, you know, in my neighborhood. Um, so most of it just comes through referral, <coughs> my sphere of influence in those areas. Um, when I compete, it's lower. So if I have three other agents that I'm going up against, it's not 90% or 95%. Um, so it's a little bit lower than that, but I don't have that many anymore. So most of it's all word of mouth and networking. You mentioned Yelp a few times, some other agents, you know, uh, I've mentioned like Zillow, things like that. Do you promote on Yelp or do you partner with them? Do I do, I can't stand it and I want my money back. <laughs> The best thing I ever did was build the profile and not pay them a dime. I did it for three years without spending any money. I probably get a little bit more in business now at $700 a month. Um, I closed three last month just off of Yelp. Um, I think it's a great resource. You have to have great reviews. They have to be real. People can see through the BS quickly. Um, and we just make it part of our process to ask for a review with every closing. So they want to know that the reviews that are on there are people that you've actually done business with. There's no way to filter that um, other than reading the context of the review. So I don't spend money on Zillow, Trulia, all the different resources. I started spending money on Yelp and I regret every moment of it. I'll probably cancel my contract in two months. Okay. Um, so we talked about length. Uh, we talked about what the appointment's all about. So what are we doing in the appointment? We're asking as many, like we asked all these questions in the, the, the beginning on the phone. Well, what do we do when we get to the appointment? Ask the same questions. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I ask the same questions, right? So I wanted to confirm with you. You said that you needed to be in Oregon by uh, three months from now, right? It's the same script. What does it do? Reaffirm, it tells them that you listen. Right. That's really all it came down to. Just tells them that you listen. And if anything comes up, if it's a, a, a partner relationship or anything else, if anything came up that didn't come out before, all of a sudden it comes out. Because you're probably only gonna talk to one of them on the phone. Okay? All right, so I'm gonna pass these around. You can take a look at these, please. I mean, I'm, I'm all for sharing. And actually one thing that I'll tell you is, please don't take photos of them. And I don't say that because I don't care. I, I'll give you the package if it really came down to it. What I want you to know is that the exercise of actually putting this together and understanding it is more important than me giving it to you, okay? And it's as simple as taking the Keller Williams package and building it and putting your little information in there. This isn't special. And if you look through the book, follow the along in the book and the different pages of the pre-listing package and then look at mine and see how similar they are. I mean, they're almost identical. So I've actually done the same thing that you'll probably end up doing. Um, just pass them back up here. If you're going on a competitive listing, do you send that out or do you yep. send out less? Nope, same thing, every, every time. Donna knows the moment that I take a listing appointment, here's the procedure, send out the package, same thing. Thank you. Yep. Now there's three versions of the packet that I put out. One is listing, one is buyer. Huh? Anybody find that weird? Same process. Nothing different between a listing and a buyer, right? You take a buyer broker agreement, you sit down at an appointment with them, you listen to their needs, you reaffirm, you close them, sign the contract, take them out and show properties. Same deal, okay? So the buyer package has a couple things tailored to the buyer, almost the exact same package. My third package is a transition package. If I know going into the appointment they have to sell a property and buy a property, I add in a couple little notes and if you want to learn more about that it's probably a different class than um, how I talk people through that okay so my main point here is you can look through it and find out what I write in here there's two things that I did to create these packages one is I took the Keller Williams package which is in your book you can find it on KW connect and I took all of my favorite parts from it okay there's different diagrams and different things that are in there I put them in the package simple. 
Second thing is I read a, a, a study. There's a study that the National Association of Realtors and the California Association of Realtors do every couple of years. It talks about what's important to the seller, the buyer, and what do they think about their realtor. Okay. What do you think the top things that people were looking for in their realtor were? Communication. Communication, that's one. That's a big one. Trust where it is, yeah. Trust. Okay, so trust is built, not spoken. So I can't put trust in my package, but you are correct. They want somebody that they can trust. What else? Experience. Experience in what? Experience. You don't have, you don't have any experience. What do they really want? Market knowledge. They want, you, they want to know that you know what you're doing, basically. To be honest with you, there's not that much about my experience in the package. I actually, I don't even have Yelp stuff in the package, and I have a gleaming, you know, reviews on Yelp. I, didn't, I don't put it in the package, okay? My point is, this isn't special. It's just really taking the Keller Williams package and identifying with what buyers and sellers' needs are. They want to be communicated with on their terms. There's a whole page in there that talks about communication. Here's, and I've gone as far as I define my hours of work. Don't be scared to do that, even if you're brand new. I define my hours of work. If you had a broken arm, and you need to check up on that broken arm, and it's a bad example. If you had a cold, and you needed to see a doctor for your cold, when do you go see your doctor? When? When you have it. When he's available. When, when he's available. available. Sorry. Yeah. Right? Is that seven o'clock at night? Yeah. Not typically. Normally between what, nine and five? Nine. Monday through Friday. Yeah. If it's an extreme emergency and you broke your arm, maybe you can go to the urgent care or the hospital. But if you want to see your regular doctor, what do you have to do? Okay. So this was a, a lesson that I learned in, in setting my time parameters. Um, I have three little kids at home, six, four, and one and a half. And this is, it's negotiable in my own head. It's non-negotiable to my clients. If a client calls me at 6.30 and needs something and it's emergent, like their hair is on fire, they can text me and I will respond. If it's not an emergency, they know I won't call them back. And they just know that. And you know what? Nobody's ever called me on it. Nobody's ever said no. Okay, so you can set your time now to make it work. Now, do I work after 6.30 at night? Yes. Am I, am I putting out fire sometimes? Yes. Am I talking to somebody about the latest, greatest house that they saw and I've been showing them for six months? No. Absolutely not. Okay, they need to wait till the morning. Or talk to somebody on the team. And I've gotten to the point where some of my team members will actually pick up the phone after hours because they choose to do that. Okay. So in the package, I've, I've already addressed. So the goal is we talked about setting expectations. We've talked about my reputation preceding me, which all of you can do. Just because I've been in the business for nine years doesn't mean that I have a, a huge leg up on you. I built this package like six years ago. And it hasn't changed that much. I mean, it really hasn't. Uh, we're actually going through a rework now, and it's the most painful thing I've ever done. Going through all the branding and everything else. But it's pretty simple. And nobody's really questioned anything on it. Nobody's really asked me any questions that I couldn't answer. It's a pretty straightforward deal. So don't spend your lifetime building this package. Get a package together so it's ready. Set the expectation in advance that they're going to get a package and deliver it. And if it's a little ugly to start, it's okay. It's okay. All right? So what have I gotten out of the way? I've been qualified. I sent them the information that I don't want to talk about in the meeting. Okay. I have defined some common objections, as you'll see, which Keller Williams provides, as to what most people, you know, object to in the actual appointment. Okay. Now, in the actual appointment, when we get there, how does it go? What happens? Set an appointment at 2 o'clock on Friday with Mr. and Mrs. Seller. Made sure everybody was going to be there. I knew exactly what's going on. They need to be in Oregon in three months. They got to sell their house. They're buying something up there. Set that appointment. What time do you show up? Do you show up at 155? Get there. 
You're knocking on the door when you expect. Okay? If I can tell you one thing, showing up, even if you think it might be a little bit rude, showing up five to ten minutes before your actual appointment will go a long ways and set the tone for the rest of your meeting. Not at 2.05, not at 2 o'clock. 155, 150. What does it tell them when you walk up? You're organized, you're ready to work, you're showing up. They might not be ready for you. And actually, sometimes I'll ask, are you, are you, are you ready? I'm sorry, it's 155, we have an appointment for two o'clock. Is it okay if we get started now? Okay, can, I, can I just tell a quick story? Yeah. Just a quick story. So this was many years ago. Uh, there was an agent out of Rancho Bernardo um, that I knew. I was uh, relatively new in the area. They, there was a team. They marketed uh, in the Union Tribune. You guys probably don't remember any of that. It's still around. No, I don't think it is around anymore. But anyhow, they, we used to have inserts. Well, I was with Prudential. We used to have inserts, and they would take the back page, a full page on that. And, so they come in and do their listing presentation and they spread all this stuff out and, and they ended up getting the listing and they asked the seller, why did they choose him? And they said, you were 10 minutes early, the other guy was 10 minutes late, you got the listing. I mean, thousands of dollars on marketing. If you didn't care about it, they were 10 minutes early, the other guy was late, and so they got the listing. And this is off topic of what you, your point was. I think that's fantastic. My favorite appointment, is a couple of different things. One is when there's a stack of marketing materials sitting on the desk, and it's like this beautiful, bound, pretty, like amazing package, and it takes me 30 minutes to sign the listing. That's my oh, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I like <don't> that. that. <laughs> or if there's a notepad on the front door or somewhere in the house when I'm actually taking the listing, um, and it really comes down to relationships, showing up on time. I mean. The timing thing is huge. The hard part is, is when they're writing notes on that, that agent's uh, notepad about you. I give them a pad and say, you know, I'm so sorry, but you have to take my pad. Sir. Um, but it's, it happens, and it's, it's wonderful. So timing is, is huge. Okay, so let's walk through a listing appointment. I'm going to show you mine. I'm not saying I'm perfect. Um, I do pretty darn good. Um, I'm structured for competition or, or referral. Um, I've learned that if I stick to my regimen and my routine, that I do better if I, than I do, if I don't, whether it's a friend or not, okay? Sometimes friend appointments are the hardest ones to get through because it takes so much time to get to business. And so what I'll tell you is focus on building your routine with those that you're not friends with so that you can practice for your friends because your friends are the hardest transactions you'll ever do. I fired friends, I chose not to work with friends, Amen. and you know, the reason is, is the expectation can blur lines, and you can have lots of trouble. One of my the greatest friends, I travel with him all the time, we just part of the ways. He was just taking advantage of my services, and I said, you know, I, this isn't going to work. And he went and bought with another Keller Williams agent down in Bay Park, and I, I was actually okay with it. It was, it actually set me free. What are some examples of taking advantage? Like just constantly contacting you, what, what boundaries is he crossing? Every boundary that I set. I mean, after hours, I mean, because you're friends. So you normally answer the phone call at 8.30 yeah. at night. Yeah. 8.30 at night phone calls, I don't even talk till 9.30 about a house that I haven't even seen yet. And just like chat my ear about, about it. He pushed, I mean, in, off record, he pushed it a little far where he was seeing properties with other agents and then bringing me in to find out how he would rehab it for himself. And I just said, you need to go work with that agent. I'm done. So, and it, it just started blurring the lines between the two of us. And I just said, I'm okay. I'm totally fine. You should go work with the other agent. Um, so, for, 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 and are you tough. still in relationship with this guy? And because we let, we let each other go, we, we, able to do yeah, we still travel. I'm planning a trip with him right now. Good friend. Good friend so right that's now. what happens. The, the, you know, you're, in, you're doing it with a friend and something goes awry. Now you destroyed your relationship. So, you know, sometimes it's just better to... And here's a great example of the listing I was talking about at Mira Mesa. It's sometimes why I'll get the listing and I'm not the friend. I've never met him before. Because they recognize that or I discuss it a little bit in the, in the appointment. Sometimes I'll get the appointment and get the listing because they don't want to ruin a friendship. 
So keep that in mind. Even if you're up against a friend, sometimes you can you can win. Um, we've been pretty successful at it. It's funny you say that because that's the exact objection handler that they taught us is about the expectation and what happens when you go into business with friends, especially on the house. For the handler, if you are not the friend, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, quick question: How many before you start? How many listing presentations would you say you do a week? And then for us, I know right now we want to focus on lead gen, but it sounds like you're very practiced. How often should we be practicing our listing presentation? Um, in short spurts, daily, if you're working on attracting listings. So between some sort of scripting, whether it's your call scripting before you make calls, your listing appointment, you should get into a habit of, of enriching your skills one way or the other before you start your day is my opinion. I either read a book for 30 minutes, I'm doing scripts, I'm doing, at this point I'm not doing listing presentation scripts, I mean, literally somebody else can do the comps for me at this point, send the package ahead of time and I can show up with the folder pre-done pre by my assistant and I don't even have to look at it. I mean, I just to the point where I just know how to read people and I know what I'm in at the moment. Um, I'm not saying that I do that every time, but I've been in those situations and still walked out with the listing. Um, so I would recommend that in short spurts, 30 minutes, focusing on scripts on a regular basis, whether it's listing appointment, buyer appointment, uh, cold calling scripts, referral scripts, whatever you have. The faster you can build your sales expertise in all areas, the better you're going to do in this business. Okay? But don't spend all morning, don't spend three hours doing it. Go through your appointment, do it a couple times, and move on. Okay. What do I? What's my time, Gary? You can go. You can go three or after. Okay. You got plenty of time. All right. So here's a couple things that I want to uh, teach you about. So we talked about the entry to the door. It's one fifty. It's one fifty-five. Through your watch. I'm here. Are you ready to get started? Fantastic. May I come in? Yes. Walk in the front door, let them leave. What's the first thing that you're both trying to figure out? Where to sit. Where to sit. Where do you sit? Kitchen table. Table. Kitchen table. Okay, good. Where at the kitchen table? Next to them. Caddy corner. Shoulder to shoulder, 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 opposite, yeah. caddy corner. <laughs> we got different answers. Okay, we walk in. Two volunteers. Let's go, husband wife. Husband wife. I love we'll you so much. I love you so much, Brett. You can pretend to be the husband. That's fine. No, I like to be the husband. Grab one chair here. You sit across for now. Okay. What normally happens when you walk in the door? You say, "Oh, fantastic! Uh, you know, why don't we pick a place where we can sit down?" Okay. When people are eating dinner at a dining table, where do they normally sit? Maybe in, let's go. Let's think back to ancient times. Sit next to each other. Sit next to each other. Who sits at the head of the table? The man. The man. Okay. Who sits at the other head of the table? The wife. Who sits in the middle? Kids. Kids. Guests. And typically, guests closest to the head. Man. You know, depending on who the guest is. But okay, so we're thinking about a table, right? So stand up, guys. Sorry. No funny, Mark. So we walk in. There's a dining room table that we're going to go sit at. Where do I sit? Definitely not the head. Huh? Definitely not the head. Definitely not the head. To the right. <laughs> to the right of the head. There you go. And I'm not saying it has to be the right. You don't know what dining table you're right. You're, you're going to sit at. Okay. But here's what I want to do. I want to identify from the phone call who's in charge, if I can. And I also want to figure out who's the decision maker. So when I come down, we walk up to the table. Now, we're going to walk up. You're going to lead me in. Okay? You lead me in. Oh, fantastic. Oh, your living room is so beautiful. Can we find a place to sit? Would that be okay? And you say, sit on the couch. You know, I'd really prefer if we sat down at the dining room table. Would that be okay with you? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Could you show me that way? Absolutely. All right, fantastic. So I'm going to walk up. Not, I'm going to interrupt you before we even make decisions. Okay, I'm going to say, you know what, would it be okay if I just set my stuff down here? I really want to get the tour. 
I'm going to step in front of you, and I'm going to set my bag or my briefcase on the seat that I want to sit on. Okay? What does that do? If you can find where I'm going to sit without being offensive, take control. I took control of the appointment from the moment I walked in the door. Give them the person to sit where they want. The head is going to sit next to you. The head is likely that the gentleman most likely is going to sit here. Most likely. Sometimes it doesn't happen that she way. Might be the head about it. It's not always the guy, right? I mean, sometimes the women's head of house. I would say more often than not, in seating arrangements, it will go with the male to the head of the house of the household to the end. Okay? If it's a four top, you kind of have to gauge it. You have to look. Okay, so if the TV's behind me, I'm not gonna sit in the seats that face the TV because that's probably their normal chairs. So I'm actually gonna position myself away from the television. These are like silly little things, but it will make your life so much easier if you figure this out. So we got a TV behind us, they're probably gonna sit in those if they watch any TV when they eat. So I'm gonna sit in one where I can't see the TV. Just something really silly, but it works every time. And one sits next to me and one sits across. Okay? Now let's say it's a four top table, you guys sit down. I get the tour, they show me the whole thing. I come in and I sit here. It's husband, wife, husband, husband, whatever it is, partners, doesn't matter. What happens when I sit at the end of the table? So at the end, you're basically saying that I am thinking leader, leader of this uh, conversation. So I overstep my boundary right. by putting myself in head of the household position. What's number two? When I'm talking to you and explaining something. You're ignoring. Can't look at both. Mm. There's two things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. Over and over and over again, and I can't read you when I'm looking at him, and I can't, and vice versa. And I'm shaking my head no the whole time. <laughs> it sounds silly. Yeah. Absolutely. You will be saying no the whole time. Okay? So that's how you overcome it. You set it up in advance, you pick your spot based on a subordinate position at the household, and you make sure that you sit in that seat, because if I sit in this seat and there's only two seats left, that would be close. I can guarantee you the wife's not going to sit on that side of me and the husband there. I promise you, it won't happen. Okay? If I sit in this one, they will sit in there. You're going to nod your head the whole time, and you're going to have trouble controlling the appointment. What happens if there's a situation like it's the husband and wife, but mom's there, and you kind of get the feeling mom really has a lot more say? Sit next to her. Okay. Figure out how to sit next to her. Okay, so there's another principle here. The other principle is, if I'm sitting next to you, is it combative or is it comforting? It could be, it could be perceived as being uh, offensive, but a little too close. Some people don't like to be sometimes so close. They don't want to have that closeness. They like their space. Agreed. But if I if I want to win you over. Would I be better like this or better sitting across from Gary? To win me over? Uh, I like that space, like it's what your materials are. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, and you might be a, a nuance in this whole thing. Um, not calling any bad names, but you know. Um, the, the, this is comforting because two things. One is if I feel it appropriate to breach your, your personal space, I can do it comforting. But I can also be next to you and align with you. If I sit, if there's, if you only have one person in the appointment, I'm still going to try not to sit across from you. Whatever I can do, I'm going to do my best to sit next to you. Okay, because it becomes not turn around and show you the information. It becomes, hey, check this out with me. Let's look at this together. Bring them in. You're aligning with them. Okay. So body language and seating, and when you're in these appointments, is super important. Okay, and you might not realize it. What do we call the couch? I call it the couch of death. <laughs> Never sit on the couch. Seriously. I think, I think my ratio flips from 90% to 10% when I sit on the couch. Seriously, it's awful. I'm talking just real estate though. Yes. <laughs> I'm watching, watching you. you go. Um, so the couch is an unknown. Just don't sit on the couch. And if they ask to, just please interject and get them to a table. If there's no room on the table, 
fight it out, whatever you need to do on the couch, but it's probably a death wish. Um, what else is a death wish? Stand up. So let's say you're in a difficult situation, like a divorce. Okay? How do you handle it? Be neutral. How do you be neutral? You try to not sit too close to either one of the parties. Okay. You're somewhere middle ground. So yep. not show favoritism. Would yep. you meet at the house or would you meet at somewhere public? Depends. You need to ask. So the, the pre-qualification in a divorce, if it is a rough one, you want to ask them, is this, a, is this something where we'll be meeting together or is this something where I need to meet you both individually? Okay. Let's say the wife calls you up and says that, that she wants to meet with you. What do you do? No, all parties have to be there to sign the contract. Not necessarily at the same time. In a divorce, I've had very high-powered divorces where we've had separate meetings. Okay. I've had some in the same room. I've had some in the same room with attorneys. Okay, so it can, anything can happen. Let's say they don't have money for the attorneys to be present. They're on good enough terms, but it's really emotional. How do you, how do you address it? I'm going to give you this little tip that if you ever have a divorce, this is going to, this is going to get you to listen. Let's say, Gary, you're, you're the, the man in the relationship, uh, you're the spouse, you call me easy. You, you call me and um, uh, you say, you know, we need to sell our home, we've talked about it, and we're interviewing agents, would you come over and take a look at the house with me? Okay. And I determine that you're okay with having everyone in the same house at the same time. What's the first thing I'm going to do? Assume to be X. I'm going to call the husband. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to help you out of really bad situations. You say, would it be okay if I called to confirm the appointment with your husband? Okay. What's that phone call look like? Trust. <laughs> it builds trust and becomes neutral. 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 Okay. Neutral. Because what happens is your your husband call or your wife. Now, your wife called me and said that you were interested in selling your home. I know this is a difficult time. I wanted to make sure you were okay with me coming over. Okay, she said you were, you're okay being in the same room. I know this is a tough time. Would it be okay with you if I met you at two o'clock on Friday? Okay, or would you like to do something separate? Because I'm okay with that too. It changes the complete demeanor. Now, this is an experience that I learned. $3 million listing. I was referred into it by the wife, actually a, a partnership of the wife that uh, was one of her counsel in the divorce. And I was referred in. And I had went over a really high-powered doctor. I mean, he was a tough cookie. And I, I got him one over in 20 minutes. And listen to this. The phone call went exactly opposite of what I thought it would. I called him. I said, you know what, uh, Mr. Seller, I just want to reach out to you. And I wanted to let you know that your wife's called me and asked if I would come over and potentially list your home. Would it be okay if we got together for a coffee before the actual appointment? You know what he said? I don't want to be your friend. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I'm just like this one. Okay. Um, so, okay, we don't need to be friends. I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm, I want to help you sell your home. Um, would it be okay if we, I mean, we don't have to meet for coffee if you don't want to. I just want to get to know you and, and just let you know that, you know, I'm in this for your best interest, and so that's what he said. I'll meet you at the house too. I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> so bad. You know what's so funny? This guy, I mean, hard nosed, to the point, direct. The guy signed the listing in 20 minutes. I mean, it was just the expression of, look, you don't have to like me. I'm, I'm in this to make sense of it for all of you. Um, it's not because that she called me. This is just to make sure you guys are whole. Okay, so if you, have, if you ever, I mean, you might not get what you're expecting, but make sure you make that other phone call. Don't just show up at the appointment because you'll fight. And my point is with, with the seating arrangement. So I went on another one, did the same thing. He said, yeah, I'll meet you there, no big deal. Well, here's what happened. Wife sat down, she's crying in the seat. He's standing in the kitchen. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> like visibly like uncomfortable I'm like oh okay and he stood in the kitchen the whole time and I'm like oh I'm so dead there's no way I'm walking out of here with a with a contract not a chance 
And I just went through the whole normal deal, and everybody's crying and everything else, and I'm like, I'm just not going to get this. I, I don't know why I'm here. It's just not going to happen. Right. Uh, uh, well, I don't like to practice that often anymore. Um, although I always practice, but just not in that context when I know I'm not getting listening. Uh, but sure enough, they hired somebody else that he introduced that I was never, I never had a shot. So it doesn't always work, but I knew that that's another couch of death for you, kitchen of death. Yeah. Do you try it? Do you, nowadays, if you call and ask me to fuck you beforehand, or do you just say, I just want to let you know, you know, do you mean, do you still offer to meet the other spouse ahead of time, or is it more? Depending on the situation, yes. Okay. Yep. So in that one, I knew I had a big hurdle to get over, and so I offered the extra appointment wanted to get to know you just a little bit before we had our joint meeting. I knew it was a really shaky one, um, and it worked. I didn't even have to have the meeting, but it, it worked sure. just to show that that piece of it. You guys want to sit down? Okay, well, you. and you knew that you cared about that you wanted to build a relationship. That's all it was. I mean, that's really what it was. I wanted to build, and he didn't care about the relationship. He just wanted to know that I was representing them both and not just your care. But you're not talking shop in that. In that. Nope. No, no, not presenting him anything, just saying, hey, you know, I know it's tough. You know, I wanted to just make sure I met you face to face before we walked in there. You know, I've been referred by so and so. I want you to be aware. That's it. So it's just building that extra layer. And by the way, we took the listing, sold it in six days for cash, gone. And it was probably the, it was difficult in the prep work to get it on the market, but once it was done, it was smooth as hell. Every scenario that you've mentioned, I've had the same, and it's gone the same way. So if they're in the kitchen and the other one's sitting, I didn't get the listing. And if you know, and if I didn't somehow convince them that I was neutral, it was a nightmare. And you know what's really interesting? I'd love to call the agent that got it. Yeah, like, I'm sure. Figure out what the seating arrangement was. Yeah, they guarantee you it wasn't the same as what I had. And, and, and no fault of my own. It didn't have anything to do with what I did or didn't do. I, I just I was dead in the water from when it started. How do you feel about we've gotten different recommendations? Um, don't walk the home with the client. Okay. Um, ask them to look at paperwork or something while you walk. Which? How do you do it? What's your advice? So, the bold scripts say that um, walk it on your own. Give them a survey to answer for you. Come back because you want to see it in the buyer's eyes, just as they would see it without any influence from you. Okay, setting an expectation that the seller won't be home. Um, I'm okay with that. It's not how I do it. Um, I've done it both ways. I feel more comfortable with rapport if I'm walking and it's typically with one or the other and they tell me about it. It also gives me an opportunity to read the type of person they are walking around the home. So like, for instance, last night was, um, we've done everything to the house. We've done the floors, we've done the cabinets, we've done the, you know, we've done, we've done, we've done. It's the biggest lot. It's the best view. It's, I mean, just, and lots of arm movements, right? She's high eye personality type. She's very, very expressive. She had a list of upgrades on the property for me. I knew I had to buddy up with her and get, get her really excited about me being there. Husband's all business, all business. So when I get back to the table, I know who's making the decision in the sale of the home, but I know who I have to impress to make it all work. So I read that out of my walk. And I keep my walk pretty short, I let them tour me around, I nod and say good things about things that they love, I talk about you know what to expect, what things are gonna happen, um, I stay pretty quiet about any changes about the house that I would recommend until later. Um, Huh? Do you get the list? No, I always talk about it ahead of time before yeah. before we actually sign. Um, but that's part of the setting the expectation as we go through. Okay, um, that's just my regular routine. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It works for me. Thank you. Yep. All right. So uh, in the appointment, so we're sitting down finally. Oh, not shaking our head. We've got the right position. We've read a little bit as to who the people are. Who knows about the different personality styles? And we kind of rushed over that so far, We're kind of all pretty new to the business, right? Um, anyone been in sales in the past? Okay. Um, how do you read people? How do you understand 
who you're working with. What are you looking for in how they communicate with you? Um, what their body language is, and this is a whole class in itself. So I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about it that you should be aware of it. Um, but how do you? Where do you focus your attention? You know, in the meeting, these are all things you should be looking for. And through the questions you're asking, that reaffirming process of the pre-qualification scripts, finding out who is going to ultimately make the decisions, how couples interact with each other, and make decisions, and make sure you overcome all of the objections. Okay? Now, when I sit down, I don't jump in and go, here's how I'm going to market your home. I don't talk about it at all. Like, none. You know what my first question is? Huh? Are you ready to decide? Gosh, you're fast. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it before and it worked, but that's fast. What's the first thing? Do you have any questions about the package? And they go, <laughs> nope. Okay, good. What I do? I reaffirm that I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. If they had a question about it, or they had an objection or a concern, they would already be worried about what my capability was. Okay? The fact that they have told me no, and especially if they've filled out my form, now I have this lead in that I know that the appointment's going down the right path. Okay? What's next? Okay. My next step is I reaffirm every question I asked him in the pre-qualification. So you told me that you're moving to Oregon in the next six months. You want to be there by blank date. You need to sell your home. You have a mortgage on it. You, um, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z. Reaffirm everything about them. You want to be there for the grandkids. Oh my gosh, how old are your grandkids? It's all about them. So find out as much. This is also the opportunity that if you had the conversation with the husband on the phone, you get to find out if the wife agrees with the responses to the questions. Sometimes they don't. It's pretty crazy. And those changes or additives in those questions will tell you their personality styles. So I'll figure out who's in charge, what kind of personalities they are. Like if I am talking to a high eye on the phone and the engineer walks in the room and starts correcting everything that I read, read back, I'm like, oh boy. I mean, for me, a lot of people, some people are great with engineers. I have a really hard time. I'm like, oh boy, it's going to be a long one. All right, let's go. And I start jotting off details back to them. Okay, here's the detail. Okay, so tell me more about that. Okay, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Um, if it is, uh, let's say, a driver personality, they try and push you through the questions. Okay, so if you have somebody like me who is very direct and isn't scared to, I mean, this is my, one of my favorite stories. Maybe not maybe one of my favorites, but it's very, very appropriate here. Um, I buy cars in a really weird way, super weird. I mean, I want to throw up if I have to walk onto a car sales lot. I mean, really, I, I can't stand it. I can't stand going through the process of the, the guy walking out from behind the window and greeting me and going, oh, what are you looking for today? I'm like, dude, I'm here to see one car or two cars. That's it. Would you, here's my license. Put me in the car. Don't ask me a lot of questions. Answer my questions and then send me to your manager. I mean, that's literally how I want to buy a car. Yeah. And I've gotten to the point where I don't even walk on the lots anymore. Seriously, I just cut it out. Like, I, there's no reason for me to meet the sales guy. I don't need that part of it. Just, this is the car I want. If I need to go test drive it, I figure out how to test drive it as fast as possible. I even ask for a manager on the phone. I say, can I test drive that car that's on your lot? I'll buy it from you if I do. And I call up their fleet manager and I say, I want this car. What's the best deal you can give me? I can get it from X, Y, and Z for X amount. Order it for me if it's not on the floor and I'll come pick it up when it's ready. I, I just bought a brand new truck. That's how I did it. I wrap it, yeah. But I, I, and I've got a big old truck you keep blocking the door with out there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's how I eliminate all the garbage. So some personalities are going to be that way where I know I need your service, but I don't really want to talk about all the stuff you do and you need to read that quickly. I mean, you talk about asking for the signature quickly. The faster you ask me for a signature in an appointment, the more I'm going to like you. And you need to be able to read that. 
you need to know that I want to get through all these questions. Tell me what you can do and how you're going to do it quickly and make it appealing and then ask me to sign the contract. And I probably will. I'm probably going to throw four or five objections at you before you actually sign, but that's my personality style. That's just how I work. And I don't know how to change it. I don't intend to change it. Um, but that's just you know, a lot of high drivers, high, high level uh, professionals will be that way. Okay. Uh, what else? I talk about I. Eyes are the floral, yeah. outgoing, talkative. You kind of have to elevate your voice and get really excited with them. And C is the C. C is the engineer, Got super detail it. oriented. Um, you know, data, 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 as much as you can. That's where I pull out immediately. I start talking about market data, market data, market data. Here's what's going on. Here's and and I start talking about like in this market. I start talking about um, here's all the data, but you know what? In this case, sometimes you don't, you can't be as practical as normal because the numbers are ever shifting. So even though I can show you what's happened in the last six months here in this market, things are changing and they're constantly changing. And I'm not here to tell you what your home's worth today. I'm here to share with you a great idea for a strategy. And then we'll arrive at a, a decision on how to work that strategy uh, at the end of this meeting. Is that fair enough? They go, oh yeah. Okay. All right, so here's the data. Now throw it out. That's what I try and get them to do. I'm like, here's all the data. Here's what it's telling you. Okay, now get rid of it. Because here's what I think. Okay. Um, yes. That, that was the market. It's not the market yes, today. It was, it was the market. That's right. why he's saying throw it out. And that's right. the truth of it. That's not what the market is today. That was <clears> the last one would be C. Or S. S. I'm sorry, yes. So if you repeat that, I'm not here today to tell you what your home's worth. What, what, okay, so you know, I'll get to pricing. Remind me of that same question. Okay. Um, in a couple minutes, I'll get the price. So um, uh, S is a, uh, a stable uh, profile. They, they like stability. That's typically your W-2 employee. Uh, not that it's a bad thing. They just they like consistency. They like stability. Um, they like comfort. So you use a lot of warm words to make them comfortable in what you're going to do. Uh, for some reason, S's really like me because I think they see what they're, they don't like doing in me, so all the stuff that they don't want to do to sell their house, they see that I can do it. So S's I normally get through really quick, and they trust me really fast. But that's just the blend of my personality style with theirs. Um, so you know, good things for them are warm and cheery. This is we want to make this as easy as possible for you. Um, how do we sell it with the least hassles? That's their their buzzwords. Um, so you figure out who those people are, and then push them through as well. Um, so. I'm reading all of these things, and it sounds like a lot, but start paying attention. Start paying attention to people that you talk to that you're not sitting across the table from or next to in an appointment. Start reading, who's your mom? Who's your partner? I mean, who is it in your life that you can start figuring out who they are when it comes to these profiles? And it will go a long ways for you. If you understand the DISC profiles really well, it will start, you'll start to learn how to adapt to them. It will help make your relationships easier. Um, and I'm not, I'm no expert, I'm not perfect, but, it, but in sales, if I'm applying sales skills in personality styles, I'm pretty darn good. So I have a good adaptation to it, okay? Um, all right, so questions about all that so far. So we've, we've gotten through pre-qualification, we've gotten to sitting down, uh, we've reaffirmed our pre-qualification scripts. We've identified who they are and done the walkthrough of the home, right? So now we're sitting down. We, we've, we've talked about all that. What do we do next? Where are we at with that? What's our rapport? I've had listing appointments for 15, 20 minutes. I'm asking for the signature. And they sign. It happens. You gotta read them, okay? Um, what happens if you ask them, so what if you ask prematurely? What happens? Nothing, you just move. Yeah, they bring up their the objection. objection happens, okay? What is an objection? An unanswered question. We train them well, it's good. <laughs> unanswered question, it's not a no, okay? It's an unanswered question. So based on all these things that we've asked them so far in demonstrating that you're capable of doing what you're doing, 
they have something that you haven't answered. Okay, how do you find out what it is? I have to ask more questions. Ask more questions. So what kind of questions do we ask? You prematurely ask. You ready to send a listing? No. No, I need to talk it over with my wife. Okay, is there something that we haven't answered here today? That's a good question. Just go right at it. I mean, I, I'm direct. I think that's a great question. And they'll go, oh, and most people will squirm. I mean, they'll just like squirm and, yeah. or they'll know exactly what you didn't answer yet. You know, we haven't talked about price yet. Oh, you know what? Thanks for pointing that out. You know, we were going to get to that. And then go into pricing. Okay, so now my script that you asked about earlier is, looking back. I'm not going to tell you what you're ah. So, how do you present your CMA? That's, that's, is that tomorrow, Friday? Is that next? It's coming up. So you're going to learn all about CMAs and how do you present the market data. That's me on Friday. You on Friday? You might want to. <laughs> so the CMA, I am like old school with CMA. Okay, my CMA is like ugly, and you know what? I don't even open it up. It's it's really entertaining. I know my stuff. Okay, and people know that I know my stuff. So I'll put it in front of them, and I don't even look at pictures. I mean, I'm to the point where here's all the data. Here's the top sale. Here's the middle sale. Here's the bottom sale. I use three actives if I can, three pendings if I can, three sold if I can. Three to five sold, depending on what the neighborhood is, etc. I say, here's what's sold around you. I say, you know, here's the top, here's the bottom. You've got these great upgrades. You've got this, that, and the other. But you know what? You're on a busy street. I really go through what my opinion is of their home right then. Okay? So let's talk about strategy. We need to make sure that we bring the most people into your home in the shortest amount of time. How do you do that? Back to your price. Okay? If you've done your job right in avoiding the marketing conversation and getting into pricing, that's how they'll answer. If you talked about marketing the whole time and now you're on pricing, they'll answer marketing. Right? Say that again. Great point. If you talk about marketing the whole time and you jump into the pricing conversation and you ask them that same question and you say, um, you know, based on the strategy, what, how do you think you'll get the most people in the home in the shortest amount of time? If they heard all about marketing the whole appointment, they're going to answer marketing. If they've heard all about the questions and reaffirming and asking them the questions and then getting straight into pricing, how are they going to answer? Pricing. That's my whole goal. My whole goal is to Skip, and I do a great job at marketing, don't get me wrong. I probably market just as good as a lot of them out there. I skim over the marketing because I want to direct their attention to the pricing. Because pricing truly drives the sale of their home. They yeah, overprice that's really it. That's what they're concerned about, too. That's their biggest concern, is what? Their price. What they're going to get for their home. Now, and I will, I will combat you a little bit on it. Okay, Gary, you've been in this business a long time, so don't take no offense. No, I think, I, listen, I'm, I learn every day, too. So my strategy behind this whole thing is the price is actually not what, what is most important to us. 99% of the time, price isn't the biggest factor. That's what they'll net. Nope, no. Tell me what they'll net. That's the reason why I want to do Huh? Is it the reason? It comes back to their motivation. The motivation for them to move is the most important sure. thing that's going to happen. And pricing is a byproduct. Yeah, I would agree. The net is a byproduct. So in motivation, what comes into play? Time, efficiency, number of days on market, making sure that they have confidence that you can sell the home and take care of it. Okay? Pricing commission, don't matter. If you set it up right. Now, we have to talk about it. We have to agree on it. We have to have a commission. We have to have a price. But I think they're all byproducts. Okay. So if you can get through all of that and get to that point where you're talking about pricing, and they go, Brad, what do you think? Okay, we got this. We're gonna do this. If they say, Brad, 
Well, that's why you're here. You're supposed to tell us what it's worth. I'll go back to the same script and I'll say, you know, I'm not here to tell you what your home is worth. I'm here to share with you a strategy on how to get your home sold. The market is going to tell us what it's worth. Your market, the, the, the market is going to tell us what it's worth. The buyer is going to dictate what they're willing to pay and you're going to tell them how much you're willing to sell it for. Okay. So Brad, what do you think the market says it's worth? Now I'm going to the right question that I want. So the market says if we pick the correct strategy here, and I start talking marketing strategies and the price. So the right strategy here is, gosh, you know, the last sale is X, your home is improved, but it's not on the right part of the street. I think we want to draw the most attention to this house by listing it at blank. Okay? And every recommendation I have on a price is all geared back to strategy, not to what I tell them it's worth. Do you know why? What if you're wrong? They'll hold you to it. Oh, yeah, what if you're wrong? That's right. They'll hold you to it. They all think their home's worth more. What happens if it doesn't sell? You told them what it was worth. What happens when you go three weeks later and ask them for a price reduction? You told them what it was worth. What's going to happen? They're going to be upset at you. Yeah. Why don't you do more open houses? Why haven't you marketed more? Why, have, why, 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 why? You told me it was worth this much. Did we picked the wrong agent. And they're going to start that conversation in their head. But if I came in and I said, gosh, this is the strategy that I, we're talking about. Here's how we're going to strategize to get the most people in the least amount of time in your home. Here's how I suggest we put it. What do you think, A or B? And give them an option. Like I'll go, gosh, 549 or a value range between five, this was last night, 549 or a value range between 539 and 569. Here's the reason why I think they'll both work. And they said, oh, grab whatever you want. They said, no, this is what you want. It's about you. Okay, I'm on board with either one of these strategies. I think they're both great ideas. Which one do you want to do? So let's say we overshoot the mark. I overpriced it a little bit. Two weeks later, I'm like, gosh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that these strategies were strategies, right? Man, in two weeks on the market, people are just flipping through listings. Pictures are stale. It's not really working. And they, 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 the first thing they can ask themselves is, what's wrong? What's wrong with the house? Right? Is it my fault now? And I'm not blaming them, right? I'm not saying you said you were going to sell it. You said you were going to do a price reduction. Now it's like, gosh, strategy in the first two weeks, your home is getting stale in the market. We've done our marketing plan that, that I showed you in the package. And man, this works almost every single time. And it must mean a couple of things. Number one, price. Number two, condition. Number three, location. So which ones can we change? You want to remodel your house? Well, we talked about, in, in my case, we've talked about that already. And I don't think it's going to yield the return that you want to improve your property. That's what I use. So it all points back to price again. And that's how you get them into a price reduction very easily and not being anyone's fault. Right? Just gets them to that price. But if, if the reaction is they don't give you a chance, they call you and say, hey, Brad, this thing is not selling. Why did you price it so high? Well, they can't blame it on me. So, you know, when we first talked about this, we discussed the strategy, correct? And that strategy was, you know, to make a decision on how we position your property within the market. But you said, no, I, I suggested how we should market the home. And you know what? The market is telling us, telling us that it's changing. Did you see the home on Lake Street? It came on the market, man, it's got upgrades. I wasn't expecting to see that come on the market, but man, it's sold in three days and you're still sitting on the market. It's in better condition. It's in a better part of the street. I mean, it is what it is at this point. They're, they've come and gone. And I called the agent and asked him if he has any extra buyers from that negotiation that might want to buy ours and send them our way. Still, it's not being shown or work on showings or what have you. So and that's a whole other class in itself and how to maintain listings and manage them, which 
in my opinion, right now, not a lot of it needs to be taught because most of the listings we've put on the market sell in the first week. Um, we have had a couple that have, you know, started to show signs of age, uh, but we get price reductions within the first two weeks and they're gone. And sometimes the price reduction sells it for the original. It's right. weird. I just did a price reduction in Spring Valley. I reduced the price and it sold for the original price. I'm like, okay, just marketing. I mean, that's exactly. a strategy. Well, you refreshed it for one. More people Maybe. saw it. Yeah. And now Maybe. it became a value proposition over a single price. So in my case, I did a value range. It brought on three more offers. And somebody says, no, I just want it. I saw it and it's mine. I'll pay you the old price. Okay. You just said refresh it, Gary. Did you ex expand upon that? You said you refresh it. You, well, you, you know, when you put a property back on the market, depending on how you do it, you took are. It up, you took it off. Okay. Pardon me? You no, I don't necessarily take it off. Just like he said, he just changed. He went from a fix to a value range. Yeah, yeah. so a price you reduction just, or a back on market will stimulate um, oh, the MLS to send out emails with your property included. Um, so any change that happens in the MLS, and there's parameters, don't quote me on exactly what the parameters are, but if you change them to a certain extent, then it will actually get refreshed out to the population, sometimes stimulating more interest. And that's exactly what that price reduction is. Let me just say one thing while we're talking about it, because I know some, I, I made the mistake um, at once. If you have a listing and you have it in escrow and it falls out, make sure you choose back on the market and not just active, because it won't get refreshed. If you just choose active, it'll come out looking active. But if you put back on the market, it'll get sent back out to all that everybody that's looking for a property in that uh, that's, that's been saved or has a search saved for them. Uh, they, they get to see it again, so it reminds them it's on the market. I, I just learned something. Thank you, Gary. I didn't know that. I made a mistake. I did that once, and I thought, why aren't we getting any push? And then I was right when we went from, what was it, Tempo to Paragon, and I, hit, I went back to Active. And um, it didn't do anything that I realized because back on the market stays there for three days. It's back on the market, then it goes back. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm actually switched back there. You know, I need it. You do a class on that. Tell Donna more about it. Yeah, why do you, uh, a lot of homes in San Diego, why is there a price range instead of just one price? Um, uh, short version uh, of a very long conversation. Um, so there's a principle out there called value range marketing. So that's the range between X and Y and how they price homes. Um, it's a strategy. And the strategy basically comes down to seller will entertain offers between $100,000 and $200,000, whatever the numbers are. Okay? Um, I'll be talking about this on Friday. Well, yeah, good. Um, so the short version is, is it, it will generate more interest with people who have agents or searching on brokerage or MLS feeds at the bottom number. Okay. The top number says the top end of the range and that generates out to Zillow, Trulia and everything else. So if you're searching online you go to Zillow and you say, I want something that's 550 or up to 550 and the value range is 525 to 575 you won't find that listing on Zillow. But if your agent set you up and sent you a listing, you'll get it, okay? So the strategy is seller will entertain offers between the two. My take on it is the bottom number is really just to catch additional interest in how I use it. The top number has to be appealing and some sort of value. If you take the bottom number and you say, okay, here's the last price that's sold, we're not any better, but we think it's going to sell for more and we're going to extend it up to 600. You're probably not going to get the interest that you really want. But if you were to take that same listing and say, I'm going to list it between 525 and 575 and the last sale was 540, you'll probably generate a lot more interest than just listing it at 550 or 575. Okay. Some sellers can't stand it. Some buyers really can't stand it. Um, I use it on 60% of my listings. I happen to like it for now that I know how to use it well. I happen to like it quite a bit, um, and it generally creates multiple offers. So let me just say one thing. Since you came from that other company, and I came from the one that started uh, Value Range Marketing. 
because it was uh, it was designed um, the, so the bottom end is to attract. So it, it's not a pricing concept. It's a it's really a marketing concept. So the bottom end is designed to attract people into the home. The top end is to satisfy that seller's every need. Most sellers want to overprice their property. Why, Brad? They don't leave something on the table, right? So they're, they're afraid, they're not confident in the agent, and I can tell you, not most of them are gonna be like Brad, they don't have the expertise or the knowledge, and they're, they're gonna overprice the property. Well, this keeps you from doing that, because you're telling them, the buyers will attain, will entertain offers in between uh, any of the, those two numbers, whatever that might be, 525 to 575. Um, and you want them a little broader. Most, many agents will make it, you know, twenty thousand dollars. Well, you know, it, you're not attracting a lot of people based on that. So you want what well, we used to say at Prudential, where they would be, if we thought it was going to sell at five fifty, we'd want to be ten uh, percent below, five percent below that, and ten percent above um, where you thought it was going to sell. That's how you figure. We actually had ranges made up for us, but. Um, you can create your own range. Just don't make them too small. So my modern spin on that, on that huh? is that the seller has no say in it. Okay. That's my modern spin. Okay. And I don't appeal, I'm not appealing to sellers by using the top end of the range. I'm appealing to marketing dynamics and making sure that the most interest is generated. And I actually feel if you stretch the top end too much, buyers won't write. I would agree with that. Because the one thing that buyers don't want to hear is no. Right? That's the number one thing that buyers don't want to hear. They write an offer too low. I mean, you'll, you'll hear this from sellers. Sellers will say, well, gosh, if they want it, won't they just write an offer? No, they won't. If you're overpriced, the buyer's not just going to write you the low ball offer that you say you'll accept because yeah. they don't know. And the most likely response they're going to get is no. And they don't want to hear that. So I use it top and bottom as a marketing piece to push it and I'm not underpricing the top end, I'm just not satisfying the seller way above what it's actually worth to, to draw in the interest. I'm using it to, to push traffic. All you're I saying, want is traffic. You're saying your top end is closer to where you're thinking about that thing. Correct. I'm not overinflating the top end of my price to try and satisfy anyone. I'm using the top end of the range to show value. And if I position that property in the market as value, it's gonna generate offers. What happens when I get two offers? Multiple. What happens when you have multiples? Push the price up. And I'm in the driver's seat, okay? So in every negotiation, I become in the driver's seat the moment I get the second offer. Pretty simple. We'll talk a lot about this on Friday. So just curious when you do- Seller is in the driver's seat, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I kind of I kind of help the seller make decisions. Just curious, when you do have the range and the seller says, "Well, they're just going to write an offer for the low," what is your response to that? Then is it kind of the same? Which just say it one more time. If you do the range pricing and the seller says, "Well, they're just going to offer the low of the range," how do you respond to that? Is that strategy basically goes back to the same. I go back to the strategy. So yeah. the strategy of this marketing concept is to generate interest. I would love for someone to write an offer at the bottom of the range, and I'd also like for somebody to write one right in the middle, or at the top, because the moment I have two, I have multiple offers. And I can, oh, and I get to do the most, most exciting part of my job, which is negotiate all those offers for you. That puts a positive spin back in their court to say, well, I want them to write that offer. That's exactly where I want them to write it. That's, that's what it's all about. I even tell them, I don't care if it comes in below it. Because yeah. when, the, when the next person calls and they say, do you have any offers on the property? And I say, yes. Guess what? Their offer has just gone up in price. Because you don't have to tell them what it is. No. You have a question? Yeah. Do you ever find that the range listing uh, caps the offers that you get? Okay. The only place where I won't use it, and I'll use a single fixed number, is if I'm off in space. So if I have a very unique property that just will demand a different clientele, like what, I've got one that will be coming up in Solana Beach, okay? There's not a whole lot of comps around it. Um, and 
you know, if I do a value range trying to nod at another sale or something, it's just not going to translate in that market and at that price point. It's around four or four and a half million. And so we're just going to set a price. And then there's not that many in inventory that are in that market. So they're probably going to get seen anyways. That, that clientele isn't necessarily looking up to three and a half or four million. They're going to look at everything in that gap and then decide what they want to see and what they're going to write on. Huh? What house is that coming up? It's not signed yet, so I can't tell you. I'll have to kill you. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so Another, he just was making sure it wasn't his parents. <laughs> <laughs> well, I well, I've already taken that listing. Never mind. <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense how you format the strategy and how you kind of get them to choose the price. What if you've talked about strategy and the price they say you know is just way too high? Um, well, a couple things can happen. One is I don't take a listing. I'll walk away from the listing all day long. Um, especially if they're overpriced. I have no interest, and I'll tell them, I have no interest in, in marketing your overpriced list. And somebody else might do it, that's fine. And they'll probably work on a price adjustment for you in the future. Um, but if it really comes down to this is what it's worth, I'll walk. Sometimes they'll come back to me. Sometimes they'll go through the other two appointments and go, mm, yeah, you might be right. Or they might have, walk away is powerful. Yeah, it is. And that, it's hard to do when you're brand new. It's really hard to walk away from anything. Um, and I struggled with that over and over and over again when I started out. And the more I walk, so I'll give you some fun ones. Um, uh, so I have a runaway buyer. Okay, this is one of my favorite uh, buyers. Not my favorite buyer. But one of my favorite stories about a buyer. So I had this gal who found me and was like all excited about this house in Escondido. And she had to go see it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to go right now. Okay, hold on. Are you pre-approved? Yes, I am. Here's my letter. She's literally, I'm on the phone with her. She's emailing me stuff. She's like all excited. And it's not even my listing. I'm like, what is, what is going on? I'm like, okay, will you come into the office and meet with me first? And then we'll go to the property. And she goes, sure. Yeah, whatever you want me to do. I'm like, okay, come on in. She comes in, go through the whole thing, buyer broker agreement, no problem, do a needs analysis. And this is on the buyer side. You're going to get to that if you haven't already. Um, and perfect. I got buyer. Like, Literally, sign, call, buyer, go show me this, I want to write an offer. We go see it, she writes the offer, it gets accepted. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> this is like two hours of my time, and I just got a half a million dollar property in escrow. Well, all of a sudden, like three, four days in escrow, radio silence. And I'm like, this is weird, like I'm calling her, I'm calling her, can't get anything. Set up the inspection. We go out, to, and so finally she calls me back. We go out to the inspection. She goes to the inspection. Everything's okay. She calls me the next day and goes, "I'm out." I'm like, what? I'm out. I'm like, did you want to talk about the inspection report? Like, it wasn't that bad. There's certainly things that we can overcome here. Nope, I'm out. I'm like, okay, do whatever you want. Like, your wish is my command. I'm like, darn, that was a good one. <laughs> um, go out again. Sure, a couple houses, four or five houses, it's another offer, gets accepted. Same thing happens for a different reason. Like, HOA documents came in. No, 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 no. I'm like, what? This is so strange. Now I'm spending time with her. Like, it's a lot of time. Get to the third altar. Literally, show her more properties. We're showing her all these houses. Buys the third property. We get in. She shows up to the inspection and walks out of the house. And I'm like, this is just bizarre. I have no idea what's going on. I've got, she's spent money on appraisals and inspect, and she's spending money. I'm like, this is so strange. You know what? We just let her go. And I said, you know what? This just isn't working. I don't know how I can service you. I don't know what I can do to make you happy. I'm convinced you probably just don't want to buy a house. I mean, <laughs> I'm convinced of it. She turned around and bought a house. I let her out of the buyer broker agreement turn around and bought a house the next week and closed escrow. And I'm like, that is really bizarre, but I'm really happy I'm not in escrow with that woman again. I mean, seriously, I'm like, I'm so relieved that the time spent with that person, I could have been doing so much other stuff. And I was so happy to let her go. And I, she saw me and okay, so 
like two years later, she sees me in Walmart. It's not my place of choice, but I was buying a little motorcycle for my son. And she's like hunting me around like a puppy dog in Walmart, trying to talk to me. And I'm like, what do you want? <laughs> you bought a house. Congratulations. Like, are you, do you want to be friends with me? Do you want to rub it in my, like, what do you want? I, I'm so confused. But it's almost one of the most relieving things that you can ever do to let someone go. To just, if it's really not working and you can't overcome the obstacles, let them go. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I am not scared of hair on a deal, something that's complex, something that you know, most of you in here would be completely uncomfortable with. I'll do all sorts of stuff. And I, it's actually what excites me. It's part of the reason why I don't farm a track neighborhood. It's because I want to go sell the Solana Beach house for four and a half million. I want to go figure out how to sell something in a different area because that actually keeps me entertained. It's like the craft and the art of the deal and, and all of that. So it's not, I'm not easy to let go, but at the same time, I've, I, I, I get very liberated when I, I know it's better for me to let them go. And same thing with friends. I let friends go and that's fine. So, okay, uh, we're way off topic. Yeah. Where are we? We are, we got to price. Um, so price, um, so we get your pricing, we give them a couple strategies, you're gonna learn more about that with Yoni on Friday. Um, what's left? Commission. Commission. What if they haven't asked about commission yet? Bring it up. Oh, do you want a slide? Both are right answers. If I get all the way to a pricing conversation I haven't heard about commission yet, I got the deal. I'm gonna get it. I'm definitely gonna get it. There's no question about it. Okay? Um, that's like the best thing ever. If somebody asks me the commission up front as the first question and they never ask it again and they forget, I got the deal. That's, that, I have that much confidence that I will get the listing before I leave. Okay? If they ask and interject it three times in the middle of our meeting, I'm probably going to walk away without a contract. I might still get it, but I'm probably going to walk away without a contract. I, I can read it that well, right? Um, so how do we talk about commission? Okay. How do we bring it up? How do we, how do we approach the subject? From value, sell our protein. Just a matter of fact, part of the deals. Yeah. One thing I can tell you about commission is confidence at this moment in everything you've done, and in this moment, you need to look them in the eyes and tell them what you charge. That's really it. Now, you might get an objection, that's okay, but confidence is everything. What do you think the average commission is in San Diego County? Five. Five percent, okay. Do you think you can get more? Yeah, six. Yeah, how often? I mean, how do you get six when everybody else is doing five? Ask for it and be direct. Okay, that moment, and this is the hardest thing that I had to overcome when I first started was overcoming my self doubt and what I could and couldn't do. Okay, and when I first started, it was like I'm going to take any listing I could possibly get my hands on. That was my goal. Right, because listings create leverage, and leverage creates more transactions. And gosh, I'll do listings for nothing if I can get them. Right, and then I went, "Why am I doing this? I'm killing myself to." And I'm running around buyers all over the place, and this is just sloppy. Right, when I figured out in that moment of transition from price to commissions, and I looked them in the eyes and I said, first thing I ask is, "What are you expecting to pay in commission?" Sometimes they'll answer the question for you. Okay. When was the last time you sold a house? What do you think most of them say? When I ask that question, what do you think most of the people say? Oh, I'm sorry. When I ask how much are you expecting to pay in a commission, 
What do you think most people say? 6%, isn't it? 6%, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Any other questions? Okay. You ready to sign? Is there any reason why you wouldn't sign with me tonight? No. Okay. Here we go. Get them to start signing. Okay. And I will tell you, if you have that mindset when you start and continue that mindset, there is no reason why you have to work for 5% on everything or even less. By the way, there are plenty of brokers out there that will work for less. Okay. Asking the right questions, showing and demonstrating that you can do what you say you're going to do or that you've shown them already that you can do will get you 6% almost every time. Huh? That's pretty cool. What do you expect to pay in commissions? That's it's the thing. coolest question you ever asked. favorite question ever. <laughs> because you know what? If they say five, I can still overcome the objection. Even though it's not an objection in their mind, I'm still going to tell them I charge six. I'm not scared of what their response will be. If they say three, I'm going to say per side. <laughs> if they say, well, what do you charge? I say 17%. And they go, <laughs> what do you really charge? Oh, well. <laughs> and like, it, it, seriously, it does exactly what I just did. It lightens the room, right? Now it's not a big battle. It's, haha, I know we're going to hire you. What is, what is the guy going to charge me, right? So overcoming that like quiet still air will get you a long ways and it will get you a higher commission. Um, so ask them questions, let them give you what their perception is. Don't assume and project your per perception on them because you all said 5%. But the reality is they all think six. Well, I thought even with like Redfin around these days, they're going to say like 2% maybe, 3%. The best thing about Redfin is that I send all my clients to them because it's a really pretty website. And they all come back. So, yes, there is, a, there is a section of our market that perceives that discount commission is the norm. Yes, absolutely, you'll have some people that will say that. I had one that was a referral from a KW agent, their son, in Texas. And he called me up and he said, Will you show me properties for a half a percent? <laughs> and I called his mom back. <laughs> Literally, I didn't call him back. I called his mom back and I said, I think you're going to have to find a different agent. And if you just set your standards. So the difference is, if you can figure out how to sit in front of these people, sit them down, be in front of them, buy your seller, the perception of what they're seeing online is not reality. It's not what they actually want. They want someone who's going to walk them through the process, that's going to represent them and make sure that you know, they are taken care of. My appointment last night, my appointment last night, I went on an appointment thinking I was getting a listing for 550,000. I didn't know if I was gonna have it or not when I walked in the door. The questions that I asked led to a conversation about paying cash for a $1.4 million property that they've already identified. Like, okay. And like, well, we were trying to do it on our own. We were talking to all the listing agents and gosh, it's just really not going anywhere. Would you represent us? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, this just quadrupled from what I started at in the beginning of the appointment. I had no idea that they were going to go pay cash for a, a, an estate in Carlsbad. Let's see, uh, when they're selling a $550,000 home, that's a pretty, the way. That's a pretty big jump. Statement. Like, <laughs> they win the lottery? That was a 3% commission. Yes, but... Um, uh, I mean, it just all comes down to the questions that you ask. Don't assume that the industry thinks one way. If you get people in front of them and you show your, and demonstrate your value, trust me, it's going to be a lot different than what you think. If you're representing a buyer and the buyer commission is 2% or whatever, how do you sell the house? house. Sorry, it doesn't matter. Okay. If you're in a buyer broker agreement for 2.5%, what's my opinion? sell the house and don't charge them the extra amount. Okay. If it's 1%, I'm gonna have a conversation before I show it to them. I'm gonna say, look, we agreed to this and I'm gonna get you a screaming deal on this because the seller is not represented very well, okay? So when we negotiate this thing, you're gonna get a great deal. 
as a part of our agreement, we've discussed that you will pay a total of two and a half percent. Typically that's being paid for by the listing side, but in this case it's not. So if this all works out, we need to make sure we account for another one and a half percent. It's never happened. I've had the conversation before. It's never worked out and it's never happened. I mean, even if I cut out the one and a half percent and didn't make them pay it, the deal still wouldn't have worked. We're talking about the commission with the sellers. They might not know that we have to split it. Like, should we yeah. inform them on it? Absolutely. We need to Absolutely. let them know, like, we're probably only taking half of this. So the simple conversation that happens in the beginning is different than when you actually go through the contract. And in your contracts classes, we should be giving them a pretty good idea of where those conversations happen. So when I go through a contract, I, I mean, I know all the contracts now, but like the back of my hand, right? So when I go through a contract, I know there's six places on the first page that I need to fill in. Okay, and when I fill those things in, I'm having a conversation about each one of those things. And one of the things is the co-op. Okay. If I can get them to agree to 6%, when I get to the co-op, I can have that conversation. Now my contracts are all pre-filled with co-ops. Okay. And same with commission. So if I want to reduce my commission down to 5%, which I do from time to time, I'm going to do it and scribble it out. I'm going to have to physically scribble out 6% to get to 5%. Because it shows that I'm doing them a service. And this might be, just so you know, this might be somebody that they're selling a house and buying a house. They're doing two. They're signing a buyer broker with me and a listing contract. And they're doing the entire transaction with me. I'll go down to 5%. I don't have a problem with that. Can you always split it for listing? I'll try to answer all my secrets. I, I, I don't always split evenly. Um, I offer two and a half percent on all my listings. Doesn't mean I always get five percent. Most time I don't. Have you ever gotten pushback on that? No. no. Especially when it's written in the contract. Not much of a conversation. What's interesting is like psychologically, if your contract is filled out before you show up, there's not much to negotiate. So if you get them to agree to the first piece, and now I've got two and a half percent as the co-op, this is how I do it. If they ask you about it, yeah, it's a lot more work on the listing side. I'm gonna spend money on marketing. I'm gonna represent your home. I'm gonna make sure that you have this great grand opening. And I talk a little bit about my marketing program, which they should have already read about. And they've seen all the things that I'm gonna spend money on. So it's not really much of a question when it gets to that point. The listing presentation's already filled out. What's the commission? Yeah, so when I- I mean the listing contract. Yep, yep. And actually, I learned a lesson last night. I should every single time have a listing contract and every single time I should have a buyer broker contract on site. Last night, I had no idea that was going that route. And it should have been present. Oh gosh, you're gonna buy a house too. Would you like me to represent you? Yes, okay, sign here. I didn't have it. But I learned that even if I don't think it's there, it's gonna be in the, it's gonna be in the file from now on. So, so in my file is a duplicate copy of my pre-listing package, comparables, contracts, and a homework section for the seller, which is the, the only the disclosures, and this is, might be a little advanced when you get to this point, the disclosures for what they need to hand fill out, not DocuSign which is the transfer disclosure statement, the seller property questionnaire, the water certificate, that's it, 10 pages. So I hand it to them and I say, before our photo appointment, you need to fill this out and have it back to me. Okay, so that's all that's in my package, that's it. Is that list of anywhere in here? No, did you write that down? Oh. Darn it. You wanna say it one more time? Copy of my pre-listing package that they've already received in color. That form that I told you about, I didn't pass it around, but there's a form that's just all about you. It's literally their birthdays, their favorite restaurant, their phone numbers, just anything I can get on them as a reason to follow up with them, I, I get on a page. I wanna know if they have a living trust, who does their insurance, stuff like that. Uh, the comparable properties, a copy for me, copy for them. I do a client copy for them. Don't ever give, give them the listing copy. And I do a listing copy for me and know the difference. And the contracts, so a listing contract, 
and from now on the procedure will be and a buyer contract regardless of what they're doing um, and uh, their homework which is the TDS SPQ and water conservation that's not really package and he, he'll be adding the Keller Williams affiliate business arrangement disclosure right away. That listing? Yes. Well, you know what? It goes out in the package in DocuSign when I get back to the office. Okay. It should really be when you're Oh, no, it is in there. It's in there. Yeah, no, it's I said to train him well. And the exclusion, Gary. And the exclusion. Well, if it's an exclusion. If you're excluded. Exclusion. Even though the Supreme Court doesn't like me right now. Don't like well, that. Play me, so you're not bad yet. You play me, so we can't do it that way. Well, you've been doing it for the last three years that way. So I fill out the exclusion for the MLS as until directed by seller. That's what I put too. They they're harassing me about it right now. Oh. I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. Because uh, here's why: then you don't have to do it again or create another oh, again. Yeah. I would drive myself crazy. crazy. I would drive myself crazy. Can you be affiliate part of the homework or just part of the? Of the it's part of the contract. So I, they fill out an agency, a listing contract, KWABAD, um, uh, possible representation of more than one buyer or seller, right. and you said agency, yeah. agency was first, right. always, <laughs> always, always first. Yeah. Uh, See, he knows, he knows his stuff. MCA, really market it. conditions advisory goes in every file. That's what we get along well. Yeah. One more question, Gary. Yes. Done. One more question. Then we're going to ask about Are there instances, or when do you decide if you're going to include a hold off the MLS? Always. 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 Why? Huh? Because I don't want to put a listing in 24 hours. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So I have a strategy in terms of what. So uh, this is actually a really good point. When I'm talking to a seller and I'm setting expectations for them, I have a timeline that it takes me to do marketing the proper way to get the property ready for sale, and to get it on the market, and then when it will be shown. All of those things are set really quickly. Like literally it takes me five minutes to explain. Okay. And so regardless of whether they're ready to put it on the market tomorrow or not, they're signing this listing exclusion. And what we were just talking about is I write until directed by seller across it, and then turn it into the MLS. And they're giving me a little flack for it right now, but the thing is, I can't, if I sign, the deal is if somebody's not ready to list their home on the market for a month, I'm still going to sign the listing. And I'll sign a seven-month listing, or I'll sign a 13-month listing, or whatever it is, I'm still signing it right then. Is there any reason why you wouldn't agree to commit to me? Right? And then that exclusion goes indefinitely until we're ready. So it's just one of those things that... You know, okay, so I wanted to part with you. I'll let you ask any questions after Gary's done uh, wrapping up. But with one thing, and that one thing is, what happens if you, uh, there's, a, there's a moment in time where you'll have a difficult conversation and you don't know whether or not they're going to sign. Okay, and you've heard a lot of objections and you're stuck. When do you walk and follow up versus when do you push the sign? Okay, and I don't have an answer for you today. The thing that you need to read is there are moments, not because of you, but because of the seller and what position they're in, that you shouldn't push. And you should identify that and tell them that. Okay. So if I've got a whole bunch of objections, I've answered everything. There is nothing that they can overcome, but they say, I've got a friend that I told them I would meet, or I've got this or that I just said I was going to meet. I can't overcome it. I'm going to say, you know what? I respect that you have other meetings uh, to go meet, you know, other people to go meet with. I want you to know that I'm still here for you either way. You have, whatever decision you make, you're going to make a great decision. And then the piece that I want to really leave with you is that, my follow-up is relentless. So the moment I leave that appointment, I'm taking videos of myself, recapping what happened in our meeting, giving them action steps of what to happen next. I'm following up the next day to see, what, did you have any questions about the email I sent you with all the action steps, and what can I do to support you? Are there any referrals that you need? I mean, literally, not are you ready to sign yet, it's all about action. So if you don't get it on the spot, 
Or if you do, you should send the same email. But if you don't get it on the spot, over the top follow up over the next week, two weeks, whatever it takes them to decide. Okay? Because all the other agents that are out there, there's probably 5% of them that will do that. And if you can do that one thing and continue to follow up with them and gain their interest and their trust, they will come back around and sign with you. So Dan and I have one right now. Man, they interviewed agents. I thought we were gonna get it right away. There's hair on it, it's exciting. There's all, stuff, all sorts of stuff going on. I will follow up until I'm blue in the face to make sure I get that listing. And, or they're so sick of me, they just can't handle anymore and they'll sign it. <laughs> but it's just to that point, the follow up, all the money's in the follow up. Because if you spent the time and the energy to build your package and send it to them and meet them, and you don't follow up with them, it's all wasted. So make sure that you're following up like crazy, and that goes for buyers and sellers. Questions? I have one more. Um, we learned this is optional, but do you include your commission in the pre qualifying packet? No. I, I, who's doing that? I just had a, I mean, in like terms of dialogue, we just learned that it's optional, it's our choice if we want to throw it in there. Um, so the one thing I would caution you in doing that, and I know there's probably people out there that do it, it gives them a reason not to show up to the appointment. So if you identify and answer something for them that it's better discussed in person, I think you're putting yourself at risk for them canceling the appointment before you even show up. I think that's the biggest risk in that. Now, if you send something out there that is flexible commissions or something to put them at ease and not actually identifying what the commission structure is, I think that's okay. If you're, if you're addressing commissions, not telling them what you charge. Because okay. unless they get to see the dog and pony show, they're not gonna sign. It's just not gonna happen. They're not gonna go, oh yeah, sure, I'm gonna sign it. Um, they're gonna wanna meet you. And if you, they give you a reason not to meet with you, then everyone, remember everyone, buyer sellers are always looking to X out things. Check things off boxes. They, they, they wanna eliminate the amount of work that they have to do. So if that was the checkbox, you're done. Okay. Close it out. Thank you, Brad. Everybody, uh, okay. Before we get a thanks again, Brad. Uh, before we uh, before we get out of here, you know, like before we get out of here, I just want to remind you um, that. You have um, homework for Friday. For Yoni is going to be uh, your your instructor. I'm not sure who the facilitator is, but uh, uh, make sure that you do that. It'll make the class more um, fulfilling if you you know because most of these agents are not going to talk right out of the book. So you know any lecture you can always supplement it by having the information that's. Um, that's in you in the uh, the packet, um, and it might help you ask other questions. So I gave you all a note card. If you would take a, just a few minutes and thank uh, Brad for his great presentation, and you don't have to thank me in front of me. Maybe oh, oh thank you, Brad. <laughs> well, I, you wouldn't leave. You wouldn't leave. So I couldn't. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I was just stick around and see if anybody wanted to. So if you have any questions, obviously Brad would have known. If you, you, know charge, you guys can take it to the front desk and I'll be more than happy to drop those off for you. Okay. Anybody didn't sign the guest register? I mean the guest register. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's way too long.